McQueen. Here. Kent, interim village manager Kent Bristol is also here. He'll return in a moment. Also present is Jason Hamby, uh, superintendent of Streets and Parks. Okay, great. Uh, announcements? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention that uh, <coughs> this Wednesday, uh, the Bryan Center is hosting uh, its second annual blood drive and mini wellness fair. That's from three to six. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to mention that the annual Kings Island trip that the Youth Center has is happening on Thursday, and that was sponsored in part by the Community Foundation, so thanks to them. And uh, I also wanted to mention on Saturday, the 365 Project is having a speaker who's coming in to talk about closing the learning gap uh, related to race and culture, and that is a program sponsored in part by the Village. That's uh, at Antioch University Midwest from 8.30 to 12.30. I would like to announce a couple things. Um, this Friday is the Summer Art Stroll from 6 to 9. There are a lot of gallery participants. We actually have a lot of great public art. Uh, the Bronze Sculpture Symposium was, uh, was um, shown uh, for the first time a couple of weeks ago, but it will be on the tour, as is another new sculpture um, at the um, school board building. So pick up one of these. There is, and also pick up a, a magnifying glass, because you'll need <laughs> it to see the map on the back. Um, but it's, it should be a great, a great Friday evening. And then June 28th is the Yellow Springs Pride event. It starts at noon. I don't know the times of any of these events except one of them. It starts at noon, so I'm assuming the picnic at Mills Lawn is at noon. There'll be speakers. There's an event at First Presbyterian Church. We'll do the sidewalk Pride Walk Parade. That will probably be at 5. Again, I don't know for sure. Um, Ruby Girls documentary at the Little Art at 6 and then the Ruby Girls will be performing live at Peaches at 10 and if you haven't seen the Ruby Girls it is something to see and I suggest you all come I don't think that there is a is an entry fee but they do um, appreciate donations for um, AIDS research and, and I have one uh, <coughs> the uh, Yellow Spring Soccer Program is going to be sponsoring a uh, very large uh, soccer tournament, uh, and I believe it's going to be 19th, 20th, and 21st of July. There's going to be about 40 teams from uh, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Uh, and when I say teams, these are going to be some of the pr premier uh, high school soccer teams, and our team just happens to be one of them. Uh, probably about 400 kids will be uh, participating in the three-day event, and uh, we're looking for it to also be a big boost to the community with upward of uh, 2,000 guests over that uh, time frame. So uh, keep an eye out for notices in the paper and so forth, but uh, I think it's going to be a fantastic event and, and also our high school soccer team has been invited to play up in Columbus this year at the, uh, I believe it's the Columbus Crew uh, Soccer Field, which is an, an honor again for uh, such a small school and a, and a small team. So keep your eyes and ears open, there will be more to come and so forth. So. Uh, Jerry, I believe it's the 18th, 18th 19th, 18th, and 20th, so it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And they are looking for sponsors, I'm sure, so anybody that would be willing to support that effort. Um, the coach... Uh, um, ben, ben Van Osdale. Is, is, is the person pretty. who's in charge of the event. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, we, I, we will forego the review of the minutes because um, we just got them today, so we will read them or will approve the minutes at the uh, at the July 7th meeting um, on to petitions or review of the agenda um, one thing I was thinking that we could do is um, the home and housing study um, that could be put up into special reports if um, folks would like I don't see, I don't know if Ellie is here. Well, they, <coughs> so, will no. she be back, Judy? I'll let her She'll know. be back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, any other 
changes or modifications to the um, agenda? Okay. Um, and um, are you, were you going to be able to review the petitions and communications? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the first one is from Steve and Cindy Piat, and it's about a vacant property on Polcat, 470 Polcat. They own the, the home next door and maintain it, and they're concerned because the landowner um, has not mown the property, and when they called the village, um, they were told it was due to a nesting provision, saying we can't make a request on unmown lots until after July 1st. Um, and so this is a policy matter, so the council may want to add it as a future agenda item to um, think about it. Um, I did not get a chance to drive past uh, the property I meant to, and I. Well, I, I did, and it appears that they have mowed it unless. Yeah. I went oh. Up and down the road, and I could Actually, see I, them. I went by again today, too. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah that's It doesn't necessarily change, I guess, the policy oh, question. Right. Um, and this came up at our last meeting as well oh, okay. um, I think about whether we should move it back. Right. I, you know, I think that's certainly something that, that staff could, could consider. I, I'd say let's just wait. I mean, we're, we're too far into the season already. Yeah, it doesn't this matter is for be this a 20, year. This is going to be a 2015 for, issue. Yeah. So it could be something in your list of things you're mm -hmm. leaving for Patty. Would you please add that one? Poor lady. <laughs> I know, <laughs> poor Patty. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then um, we also, uh, uh, often I don't read the general things that we get from a lot of the county agencies, but we did get a note from the Green County Council on Aging about a program on memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, and that'll be Thursday the 19th from 6.30 to 8.30. They'll have a presenter who's going to speak about um, the symptoms of dementia and normal mental loss and also answer questions that people have about that um, and there's uh, information about questions so if you if you're interested in that you should get one of the flyers and then um, we also got a letter from uh, Kathleen and Jeremy Buck uh, expressing their full support for Antioch College and alternative energy initiatives that's it thank you um, moving on to public hearings and legislation First, we'll have the second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2014-13, approving a sewer rate adjustment for registered residents. Okay, and do you want this in whole or by title? Just do it by title. All right, this is an ordinance amending Section 1048.05, service charges of Chapter 1048, sewers and sewage, of section, section 10, streets, utilities, and public services of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, providing the option of special reduced seasonal rates for sewer services for residents whose water use during summer months is greater than usual do the gardening or lawn watering. Can I have a uh, motion, please? I so move. Second. Uh, Kent, would you review this briefly again? Uh, actually, we've been doing this for, I think, three years now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I just was a little apprehensive about <clears throat> carrying on a practice that wasn't sup supported by uh, the village's ordinance. In other words, there's nothing in the ordinance says we can do this and so we're simply taking an experimental pilot project and making it ongoing and and the other thing we are asking is that um, residents register every year so even if, if you participated last year um, you still need to re-register again this year and you can do that down at the utility office and I think we should probably clarify that it doesn't include swimming pool filling swimming pools <coughs> it's only for is, is it is that the case or does that's true yeah so it's, it's for irrigation <coughs> purposes yeah what we do is we compare your summer use with a dry a, a winter use and if the summer use is greater you get a reduction in the sewer rate that ma mirrors your winter consumption because the water is not going into the sewer system exactly right and uh, the deadline to sign up, uh, by the way, is August 31st. So. Uh, Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Uh, it, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the floor for discussion, for comments from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Askland. Yes. Hausch. Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, <coughs> moving on to um, second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2014-14, accepting a utility easement across the property of Family Choices Real Estate, LLC. Did I recuse myself last time on this one? You did. Yeah. You did, but you didn't leave the room. Okay, then <laughs> I will turn this over to you. I will sit quietly. Viewers at home, get your fingers <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead, Judy. Okay. Whereas the construction of a new hotel at the northeast intersection of Xenia Avenue and Limestone Street requires water service to the site, and whereas the nearest location capable of providing service adequate to the demands likely to be imposed by the new hotel is the water line directly west of the hotel on South Walnut Street, and whereas the most direct and efficient path to connect the water line with the hotel requires crossing the land of Family Choices Real Estate LLC, and whereas Family Choices Real Estate LLC has kindly agreed to grant the necessary easement to the village, now therefore the Council of the Village of Hill Springs, Ohio does hereby ordain that section one. The village hereby accepts the utility easement preferred by Family Choices Real Estate LLC from the date the easement was signed. Section 2, a copy of the easement is attached here to and incorporated in this ordinance by reference. Section 3, the village relays its thanks and appreciation to Family Choices Real Estate LLC for their cooperation and assistance in a project likely to be of mutual benefit to them and the village. Section 4, this ordinance shall take effect and be enforced 30 days following its adoption. Okay, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do you want to speak to it at all, Ken? I know this is the second reading, so it's... Uh, the only thing I will say is this, this is this is a great help to us because the alternative ways of providing uh, adequate water to this site involve boring under the intersection at Limestone Street and Xenia Avenue, uh, which is just full of wires and pipes and uh, an invitation to some kind of disaster. And this <laughs> this shortens the sp shortens the span, simplifies the project, reduces the price, and uh, I hope everybody coming in from out of town for a funeral will <coughs> stay the, stay at the hotel and help compensate family choices for uh, helping us do this. Okay, <coughs> great. All right. Um, since this is a um, an ordinance and second uh, reading, we need to have a public hearing. So. Um, unless there's any comments from council, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Any comments? All right. Uh, seeing and hearing none, um, I'll move it back to council for the vote. All right. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Askland? Yes. Thank you. Um, Next is the second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2014-15, <coughs> approving the final subdivision plat for the Center for Business and Edu Education and declaring an emergency. Whereas Community Resources, a.k.a. Education Village, has proposed a subdivision plat for the property known as the Center for Business and Education, and whereas said plan has been reviewed in both preliminary and final form and approved by the Yellow Springs Planning Commission, and whereas approval by Village Council is required for work on the subject site to go forward, now therefore the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1. <clears throat> Having reviewed the scrutiny and actions of Planning Commission, this Council hereby approves the final plat here attached as Exhibit A, presented for their review. Section 2. This final plat is approved subject to the conditions as contain contained in the Planning Commission minutes of May 27, 2014, as directed by Planning Commission as a part of their oversight. Section 3. This ordinance is hereby declared to be an emergency measure immediately necessary to preserve the public interest and for the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the village, such emergency being the need for economic development to sustain the income tax base, wherefore this ordinance shall be in effect immediately upon its adoption by council. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, first, I, I will let Kent explain <coughs> um, the specifics of the subdivision, mm -hmm. but I will first explain the emergency language. This is a second reading, so we have had two readings of this. Um, we had public input the last time, and we will have public in, a public hearing this time. Um, it will simply, the, the emergency is that it will simply go into effect immediately um, after the, this reading. So um, we have given it the full, um, the full hearing that, that we typically allow for ordinances. So Kent, would you describe this? Yeah, yeah the non-emergency ordinances take effect 30 days after they're adopted, so this simply shortens the waiting period. Um, yes, it, we started the process of financing improvements to that site several months ago when some of the residents pointed out that we had not followed our own procedures, that the uh, village's codes required that 
both Planning Commission and Village Council had to approve a plan. And although we could find numerous references and instances where a plan had been presented to both bodies, in no case did anybody ever raise their hand and make a motion to approve it. So we went back through that process. And the process, the method we used was a subdivision because anything more extensive than that requires a lot of information. Let's, for example, the area zone planned unit development. To do a planned unit development plan for people to review, you have to know who the end user is, what size their building is, where it's going to be located on the lot, how much parking it requires, and all of that is highly speculative. We have no idea who the end users might be at this point. So our planner suggested a way to do that is to do it as a subdivision plan by installing the road that we had planned that de facto divides the parcel into three separate lots, which is a subdivision. And so that's what we did. We uh, proposed a subdivision plan to the Planning Commission. We gave them a preliminary plat. They reviewed it. They asked for changes. We made the changes, came back with a final plat. They approved that. And that's what's been passed on to Council, and that's what we're acting on at this point. Thank you, Kent. Uh, comments, questions from Council? Uh, this is a public hearing. It's a second reading and a public hearing. Uh, so I will open the floor for citizen comments. Matt? Matt, Matt Carson. I um, still do not believe that this is an emergency. Um, it should not be passed as an emergency ordinance. It should be passed like a regular ordinance. And it seems like there's a special set of rules around this particular ordinance. Um, unlike other ordinances that are emergency ordinances, they usually have one reading. For some reason, this one has two. And there's really no reason for it. And the reasons stated by council members are different than the, the reasons stated by the ordinance um, for why it's being passed. It seems like the reason it's being passed is that it just wants to be rushed in. Um, you want to rush it through. But that's not what the emergency ordinance actually says. It says that it has to do with the tax base and all these things. So there seems to be a major conflict there and a contradiction there. So thank you. Thank you. Any other <coughs> comments? Roy? And I'm sorry, I should be saying state your name and keep your comments to three minutes. So, uh, my name is Roy Qualls. I serve on the Community Resources Board. And I would urge the council to take the opportunity to take this definitive step to at least make some progress on this project so that we can, can uh, get the thing planted. There's a lot of discussion on uh, the financing and so forth. Uh, I would also urge the council to think in terms of how it fits with the village plan, uh, the economic sustainability plan that I believe is on your docket. Uh, I would also urge you to study that carefully, get that on the board, and get that voted up or down. I can't think of anything that uh, I would prefer to have as a village manager coming in than a nice checklist of here are the priorities of the community for economic development, here are the people I need to go talk to, mm -hmm. and what my job would be to line up the resources and get people focused on the task. Uh, at Community Resources, we have been uh, busy uh, sharpening our thoughts about the uh, theme of the park. So one thing that we're discussing now is that the theme should be sustainability. Not that we would turn down other applicants, but in terms of who we specifically reach out to, uh, that seems to be kind of an idea that's growing, uh, getting some traction that fits well with Antioch University, if it's well with Antioch College. Uh, second, uh, thirdly, there's uh, some notion of, as somebody put it, Roy, who's going to build these buildings. And so there's uh, some thought afoot to form a group of local investors, uh, thought being that you know, if people will put their money in with uh, known criminals like Merrill Lynch and Bank of America, then why wouldn't we invest with each other? people that we have to look in the eye every day we go to the store and you know if we can trust people we don't know what's it say when we can't trust people we do know so those are just some of the thoughts that are kind of uh, uh, percolating among uh, community resources uh, we would really encourage council to do its part in the process by uh, making it clear to the community where this fits in with the economic sustainability plan and get that as a matter of record. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Roy. Any other comments? See, oh, 
Jerry. Jerry Sutton, I'm on the Community Resources Board also. I speak in favor of the proposal and harken back to the fact that Community Resources has been working in partnership with the village and various community organizations for over 15 years to advance uh, some development in that particular piece of property. Not standing, not counting the investment in the building for Antioch University <coughs> Midwest, over $1.1 million has already been invested in this initiative. Uh, there is also $400,000 that's been on the table for eight years from the Corps of Engineers to further the development of this particular property. Uh, and that 1.1 does not include the three point or $344,000 that was lost because we didn't timely uh, get it committed of additional federal money. So we are speaking in favor of this. We think we need to move forward and this will be, uh, this uh, ordinance will enable you hopefully to record the property, the right of way that community resources deeded to the village in December 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Any other comments? Yes. Uh, my name is Amanda Winfield, and um, I don't support this. Um, and the gentleman who spoke after Matt was saying that a theme for this would be um, sustainability, which is ironic because there is going to be a building across the street, Creative Memories, that will be empty. And sustainability, um, you would repurpose buildings and not build new things, especially when we don't know, like Kent was saying, we don't know who the end um, tenants will be or any of that stuff. It just seems like a lot of unknown, like a really big gamble. And also to point out what uh, Christine Roberts' letter says that economic development um, does not create jobs and does not um, do very much for working class people who wait tables or make minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Rick Donahoe. Um, I've always been a little bit confused about this. Um, Jerry mentioned, what was deeded? Was it the easiness deeded or the property deeded? Oh, the, the, property. the right of way. The right of way. The right, right of way was deeded, deeded to the yes. village. Yeah. Not the property. Well, 11 acres of the property, yes. To we own, was. no, to us. Uh, oh, to you. Are you talking about the road or are you talking about Antioch University? Well, Antioch University. Um, they own a piece of property. They own the property. Right. But now, there's another, what, 35 or 6 acres? And who owns that? Community resources, and the village owns 11 to 12 acres of that. In that the, is the roadway. In the form of easements? Mm -hmm. No. In the form of land. In the form of land, permanent yes. deeded easements. Right. Yes. Okay. Permanent deeded land. Okay. We own the road. We own the land. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's always been confusing. Now, let me ask. Um, are we talking now, can we talk now about, we're not talking about funding. No, we're not. We're just and talking we're, and about And we want to keep that as a discreet conversation. Different conversation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Dawn. Hi, I'm Dawn Johnson. Um, just for clarification, while you do have a deed for 11 plus acres, you will not own that property until it's in the hands of the recorders after the subdivision goes through. That's just clarification. Yes. The other thing that I want to bring about is there was conversation in Planning Commission about having something from Antioch University that would permit the connection through to their parking lot. Do you actually have a letter from Antioch University granting that or is it just a verbal? Because I think it's important if you don't have that letter, you need to have that written on the plaque that, that Antioch University will need to provide access through that. Otherwise, you're going to have a stop and you'll need either some sort of a cul-de-sac or something that's not in the current um, design. Yeah. So. 
I've request, I've made a formal request of Antioch. Their board met, I think, a week ago, and I've made a couple of calls to their attorney. I have not gotten an answer yet to whether they accepted our proposal. Uh, but the ordinance says that the council is accepting it under the same terms and conditions that Planning Commission did, and that term, one of those conditions is that if we don't get an easement from Antioch, that we put in a turnaround at the end of University Way. And there's space to do that. So it's, it's A or it's B, but neither one should stop it. Okay. I, I, I hadn't heard yeah. that final piece. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Don. Any final comments? Christine? <coughs> Yes. Hello, my name is Christine Roberts, and um, I would just like to make a few comments about growth coalitions. These are um, growth coalitions uh, profess to hold the highest interests of the public in mind, yet quickly come into conflict with opposition on many levels. Um, the first would be with residents who feel that <coughs> funds should be spent on and, um, more uh, services and not on growth. Uh, the second conflict that growth coalitions come into is from corporations, believe it or not. Uh, corporations, uh, growth coalitions may seem to represent corporations, but they're entirely different. The difference being growth correlations are land-based, but corporations are free to move about, and this puts pressure on growth, co uh, growth coalitions. The third conflict with growth coalitions comes uh, from other cities that have their own growth coalitions. And because uh, the cities get into competition with each other, it begins to um, uh, drive down the uh, payback that you can possibly get from this type of a economic development. Uh, I oppose uh, the whole concept of growth coalition theory. It's just, uh, it is a theory. Uh, it belongs to the 20th century. Uh, uh, this idea that you can just grow and that's going to produce economic development is, is, is a theory that did not, it was unreliable in the last century and it's become less reliable in this century. So I applaud those members of council who have severe doubts about this and I, uh, I highly question those who feel that this is a good idea. Thanks, Christine. Yes, thank you. Any more? Anything else? Uh, Ellen? Uh, Ellen Hoover. I'm a supporter of CBE. I was on CBE in 1999, prior to the land being purchased. Um, in those 16 years, during my time owning a business in the community that dates from 1992, uh, living in the community which predates 1980, um, I have heard a lot of discussion about what we need to do for growth and what we need to do for economic development. What I have not heard, I've also seen the visioning, which I supported because I felt it would give this community a blueprint around many issues that we faced, including growth or lack of growth, depending where you sit on the fence. Um, I supported rezoning, even though it wasn't necessarily something that was going to work out well for the business I own. It did work out well, but there was no assurance of that. Uh, I, uh, I support zoning because growth will happen whether you have it regulated or whether you unregulate it. And I don't feel unregulated growth is particularly a good thing. I think having a piece of property that you know what's going to happen that you have a lot of input into and that the community has a lot to say about is a lot better than a vacant piece of property <coughs> with no regulation, possibly in private hands where you have no ability to give input. That said, what I haven't heard in this community in 16 years is what you're going to do if you don't do this. What are you going to support for economic development? or are you going to freeze it? I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing what people think they want, and there's a lot of input, but I am not hearing even some of those simple things, like adopting a plan, 
rewriting or not rewriting the loan program. Putting into place other things that are supportive for the businesses that you have here. I'm just not hearing this. So I'm asking you to pass this and I'm asking you to support it. It's been supported through many councils prior to this. I'm asking you to do that because you need to do something, folks. It's 16 years. It's kind of time. Thanks, Thanks Ellen. <coughs> Any final comments, Glenn? I'm Glenn Watts. I was a founding member of Community Resources served on it uh, until I timed out, including the period of time when the uh, land was acquired. And uh, I've watched over the years as this project has come before council and been acted on and approved. I've sat through many public hearings, I've sat through public presentations, and I believe that there is support for improving economic growth in the community. We have seen businesses come uh, grow here and then leave because they have no place to to expand. Uh, we've lost some very good businesses because of this. Therefore, I urge you to take action, to not delay this any further. 16 years is a terribly long time to wait for this. I had a basketball coach who once said, don't be afraid to take a shot. Yes, you may not make it, but remember, you'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. We need this. Thanks, Glenn. Any more? Seeing and hearing none, I will bring it back to council table. Um, any further discussion from council? Um, I would like to clarify that um, whether this is, you know, whether anybody is in support of the CBE or not, I consider this important legislation because what it actually does is secure um, the village ownership and village of that roadway. We will be um, submitting to the recorder the ownership of that land. So to me, this puts the village right in the center of that development where if we didn't do this, we would not be. So. Um, it, it is, and, and the emergency legislation is supported by law, or the, the emergency language is supported by law, and we quite frequently do two readings um, with emergency legislation. We've actually been doing that quite a bit when we, when we actually want to have more community input, but we need the legislation um, approved at a certain time. So we actually, that actually has been, become more of a practice of ours. Um, ready to take the vote I'll just say I, I second what you say I think it's important that the village have a put have that property um, and that we do this step I'm not concerned about the fact that it's being done by an emergency ordinance I don't think that it's trying to get around anything Thanks, Brian. and I I would also agree with everything that Karen just said um, this is plat development and uh, this is a piece of land that is a part of the village and I want it platted out done appropriately and having the village owning all the rights of way rather than having private roads out there I think is a good thing it may it gives us more chance for public input if anything happens out there um, and this has been discussed at length in public hearings, not just in council, but also at planning commission. So I, uh, I'm, I'm speaking in favor of this, this particular ordinance. Thanks, Lori. Uh, and you, and, oh, and if, if I'm correct, by, by accepting this easement, uh, we have not committed ourselves to actually build a road or commit any no. funds to this. Yeah. It, it just, uh, gives us that opportunity in the future if we elect to yes. uh, to do that. Yes. But, but I'd rather be doing that with something I own versus something I don't. Right. So. Thank you. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Askland? Yes. Sims? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Uh, next we have reading of ordinance 2014-16, declaring the intent of council to proceed with the development of CBE. 
This is determining to proceed with the Center for Business and Education Public Improvement Project and authorizing the village manager to retain bond counsel and solicit bids from contractors. Whereas the village council has determined that there is good cause for proceeding with the development known as the Center for Business and, Edu and Education, CBE Public Improvement Project, and whereas the CBE Public Improvement Project requires the use of public funds for the construction and extension of public roads and streets, including the necessary stormwater, sanitary sewer and water facilities, traffic signals, and other necessary appurtenances, and to solicit bids for this project. And whereas in order to proceed with the CBE Public Improvement Project, the village will need to issue bonds and solicit bids from contractors. And whereas this ordinance is being passed pursuant to Section 70 of the Charter of Yellow Springs that creates the right of referendum for measures pertaining to the ordinances determining to proceed on public improvements, now therefore the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Green County hereby ordains that. Section 1. <coughs> The Council of the Village of Yellow Springs hereby determines that the Village intends to proceed with the CBE Public Improvement Project. Section 2, the Village Manager is hereby authorized to retain Bond Council and solicit bids for the construction of improvements related to the CBE Public Improvement Project. Section 3, this Council finds and determines that all formal actions of this Council and any of its committees concerning and relating to the passage of this ordinance were adopted in an open meeting of this Council, and that all deliberations of this Council and any of its committees that resulted in these formal actions were in meetings open to the public, all in compliance with the law. Section 4, this ordinance shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, <coughs> Uh, this ordinance does not directly approve funding for the project, but it states the intent of the council to move forward with the project to work on obtaining financing and obtaining competitive bids by the manager. To make clear that the right of referendum exists and to hold the CBE funding issue in abeyance during the referendum period, council we will be considering this legislation to signal an intent to move forward with the CBE if it is approved by a majority of council. This is not an emergency legislation, meaning it will not take effect for 30 days. And there will be two readings. Um, per the charter, if this legislation is approved, it will allow citizens to put a referendum on the ballot in November. Um, Kent, would you, um, is there anything else you want <coughs> to speak to in regard to this ordinance? No, I, th I think you've summed it up very nicely. Thank you. Comments, questions from council? Uh, I, I have a comment and not a question. I guess I did speak in length at the last meeting that uh, I've had, I have some concerns and some reservations with uh, the, the project and with CR. Uh, since that time, uh, Community Resources, and, and I am an ex officiary member of the uh, CR board. Uh, we probably had a come to Jesus meeting. Um, and uh, I spoke uh, my displeasures and we went around the room. But what I saw and what I felt within that meeting is yes, we needed uh, some new energy to, uh, to move this thing forward. Uh, we have a lot of history, a lot of documentation. Uh, many councils before me uh, have passed or ordinance and resolutions uh, to move forward. My main concern was the fact that uh, there wasn't a plan that I could put my hand on and actually read through, uh, picking up the history, uh, the ordinance that had been planned, what the uh, CR board and the group had planned on doing what their future plans were. Um, we put together a group and we realized that we had a lot of the documentation that would uh, answer my concerns, but we needed to put it in one document where we could read. Uh, the thing that I really was interested in hearing is the what ifs. What if uh, council decided not to build the road. What if the road was built and we needed a building? Uh, the group came up, came up with some very good ideals and I wanted to see that documented and they're in the process of documenting it. I, I told them I did not want them to rush and put a document together and present it tonight 
uh, to counsel and there may be some mistruths or errors in it. Uh, what CR has decided to do is to have an all-day working session, and I believe that's going to be on the 21st, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, where uh, we will again be putting our heads together and coming out with a document that the whole community will be able to read and understand. Uh, giving those actions and so forth uh, it has renewed my faith and confidence that we have a good group of people put together and that the project uh, should move forward. That's not saying that the project and all phases of the project will succeed, but at least we'll be moving forward. Uh, I've been in Yellow Springs now since 1965. And like many of you here in the room, I've seen businesses come and I've seen businesses go but I've seen more businesses go because we don't have a place here for them. Uh, we have elected, we had elected uh, many years ago that uh, we wanted to stay small. Uh, we value green space, so we have purchased quite a bit of green space within the community. This is the last real area that we have that we can try to develop and try to help um, lower our tax burden and when I say our tax burden our tax burden right now is being supported basically by the citizens here through income tax we need another source to help <coughs> generate income generate some revenue this is why I plan on voting yes for the resolution uh, and I plan on doing everything <coughs> in my power as long as I'm on council to make sure that this project has some means uh, to succeed. So, uh, that's kind of where I stand. Thanks, Jerry. Um, other or council comments, or do we, want, do we want to open it up to the floor to citizen comments? Yeah, I mean, I have a number of things to say, but I'd be happy to listen to citizens first. Okay. Dave? Uh, my name is David Boyer. I'm on the uh, Community Resources Board. I'm actually the president, so I have a big target. Uh, <laughs> I'm just here to say that, that, first of all, I wanted to offer a public apology because on the 2 June meeting, some of us kind of walked out prematurely. We thought all our business was done. Apparently, there was still some discussion taking place. We, we offered that apology. We, that was not uh, a good move for us to leave at that time. We just thought that our part of the agenda was finished and it was not. So it was a misunderstanding on our part. We hope you don't take offense to that. We're back here before you now in, in all uh, honesty to, to help get this through. We've been working with this council and other village councils for the past 12 years. There's been over 22 ordinances and resolutions passed in support of the CBE. Uh, I too have lived in the village for quite a while since uh, the late 80s, 1987 I believe I moved here. Um, and I remember that some of the largest employers in, the, in Greene County were here in, in Yellow Springs. We had Vernet Laboratory with nearly 300 employees. We had uh, Antioch Publishing. We had YSI, which we still have, but it's now owned by Xylem. Um, uh, Morris Bean also on the outskirts of town. But those enabled not only us to have a tax base that helps support the services and the level of service that we're accustomed to in a village this size, it also provided opportunities for local people to have uh, living wages, to build a career here, to earn a retirement, to become a, a part of this community because it offered them a place not only to live in the community but also to work here. Uh, I think that is so critical to the long-term health of our, our uh, community. So I'm hoping that, that everyone will look at this with a clear eye. I realize that you know we don't have people banging on our door saying, hey, I want to build some nice buildings out there. But if we don't have the infrastructure in place, it's, it's never going to happen. Uh, my thoughts are, you know, we, we've seen <coughs> SAS Automation move to Xenia. Uh, that's Trent Fisher. He's a resident here in town. He has a $1.3 million payroll. I mean, just do the math at 1.5%, we could be doing pretty well. Uh, LaserLink, Dan Dixon's company. I'm not, and I'm not saying that these guys would have necessarily built out here. I'm just saying that the opportunity was lost. Uh, I just think that we need to have something ready, shovel ready. I think we can attract the businesses. We may have Yellow Springs Brewery become the next Sam Adams. We may have Enviroflight Enviro uh, 
get a big contract and, and need to expand. We need to have places for our homegrown uh, businesses to expand, to stay in the community, to become a fabric of the community, and they'll reflect our values. We're, we're not necessarily going out there trolling, looking for some other company, uh, but if they show up, that's great. But we want to grow. We have a tradition of growing businesses in Yellow Springs. That's where Vernet came from and Antioch Publishing and YSI. Those were homegrown garage, basement businesses. Thanks. Sorry, Dave. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other comments? Um, Rick? Yeah, Rick Dunholm, yeah. Um, talking about moving forward, um, Jerry, I'm with you about, you mentioned why would you put money into roads that we don't know? Well, why would the village put just talking about moving ahead, not talking about financing in particular, but why would we as a village move ahead and put money into land that we don't own? Um, isn't that right? We don't own the, uh, that whatever acre just left after the roads, 25, 26, something like that. Um, I've been in real estate for years, and um, I don't put money into things that I don't own. After all, that land was bought with village money. It was bought with $300,000 that the village lent to community resources. Um, why doesn't community resources, let's get fair about this, deed the whole thing back to the village. Then let's move ahead with this thing so we can all be on the same we can invest in what we own. Other than that, why doesn't community resources, like Roy suggested, not just invest in buildings, why don't they invest in the land? Uh, why don't they buy it? I mean, um, that's all I can say. Okay, Rick? Yeah. Uh, it's a joint venture. The community resources, the Community Improvement Corporation, and part of the reason they are used is because the constraints on public bodies like the council for open meetings and public records and so on are so rigorous that it makes it very difficult to conduct uh, real estate negotiations, for example, the prospective user. So them as a private nonprofit can do things that we can't. And we do have a stake in the property. We don't hold the title, but community resources is obliged by the terms of the loan agreement to repay that money to the village as they find end users for it. So we certainly have a stake in the outcome because that helps us get our money back. Well, I, I can understand that we have a stake, but I also understand, and I hope everybody else understands, that the village does not own that land. Yeah. And, okay. And, and to move forward, uh, that would be a good thing to do. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'd like to hear from people that haven't spoken yet, Don, on this issue. Um, Richard, is that you? Well, this is a different issue. It's a different order. Let me just. <coughs> Come on. I'll bring up the rear. <laughs> uh, I'm Richard Lapides. I live in 130 West Limestone Street. My experience as a CEO of a manufacturing firm for 30 years, uh, buying and selling commercial properties all over the United States and, and in Europe. Mm -hmm. And being fairly careful about the state of the market is as follows. Number one, there's a tremendous shift in the American economy from labor-intensive to capital-intensive projects. The labor content of any business is being reduced radically, which is one of the reasons there are so many poor paying, poorly paying jobs and only very few people are, have highly paid jobs. So it's a real threat to the whole structure of the American economy. And there are several books about this that I think are written by reputable economists. Mm. Uh, I think the, the gaming of publicly controlled parks for business of one kind or another has reached a sort of crescendo. I do think that if the land is free and if the village is willing to finance buildings for lightly capitalized smaller businesses who may want to grow here, 
And if we have that in mind, we probably can get some takers. I do think otherwise the market is terrible. I think it was declining 16 years ago, and I think it's declined far more in the last 10 years, and particularly in the last five years. So let's suppose the American economy improves somewhat, and we're no longer in the Great Recession, and businesses have some confidence. The kind of businesses that are going to invest are not going to be labor intensive. They're not going to be focused on jobs. They're likely to be internet intensive. They're almost definitely going to be internet intensive. So do they need a lot of space? Probably not. Businesses that are being capitalized on the mark stock, going public on the stock market with valuations of, let us say, close to a billion dollars, often have as few as 15 employees. So really, we're, we're providing or looking at the world in terms of what's called the first machine age, but lo and behold, we find ourselves in the second machine age when those, when those kinds of values are into, into, shifted tremendously. So I would be very, very cautious. It's not saying that there isn't a way to go about it. I don't know all the answers, but I must say one of the things, and I think everyone has the best intentions on both sides of the issue, but what I don't see is a comprehensive, professionally prepared marketing plan that identifies how to go about A, finding people who might be interested, and B, finding out how they're going to be financed to build these buildings that don't exist unless the village wants to assume those responsibilities. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. <coughs> Don. Don Johnson again. Um, the gal who reminded everyone that we needed to go through the subdivision process. I want to remind you about the Ohio <laughs> Constitution. Um, in um, Article 8, Section 13, it prescribes for economic development to create and preserve jobs and employment opportunities, improve economic welfare, blah, blah, blah. It lets the village, municipality, work with community development corporations to do some interesting things. However, there's a caveat. Provided monies raised by taxation shall not be obligated or pledged for payment of bonds or other um, obligations. So. The Ohio Department of Development put together a suggest suggested implementation plan for a TIF, which Kent told me that's how you plan to uh, refund this. And I'm wondering if Community Resources is aware that they may well be on the hook for that $90,000 loan repayment because, unless otherwise specified in the legislation authorizing the TIF, the parcel owner's obligation to remit service payments must be reflected in a contract with a local government entity. The Ohio Department, um, excuse me, the Ohio Development Services Agency, formerly known as the Ohio <coughs> Department of Development, strongly urges <coughs> local political subdivisions to obtain legal counsel in drafting the proposed legislation and service <coughs> payment contract. Note that the agreement should contain guarantees from the parcel owner <coughs> that sufficient funds will be available to the political subdivision to retire the debt incurred from this specified public infrastructure improvements. And the county treasurer is charged with the responsibility of creating the tax equivalent funds and the redirected service payments. So essentially, they're basically telling you, we can't use our tax dollars to repay that bond. They're helping you figure out that plan to work with the property owner to make all this happen. I want us to move methodically. I don't want to stop this. I suggested another a method um, which was used, uh, was suggested in the Civic versus the City of Warren where they use special assessments to recoup the fees. We have a longer period of repayment. This with your bond, you've got 10 years, um, maybe 20, I believe. 20. 20 years. But nevertheless, tax dollars cannot be used to make that payment. What are we going to do? Are you guys ready to do it, community resources? You're the current landholders, and those repayments occur annually, monthly. Let's talk about it. Thank you. Any other comments? Christine? <coughs> so, yeah, following up on Glenn Watts' uh, 
illustration of the guy with the basketball, uh, I, I know a guy who had this month's rent, but he didn't have next month's rent. And so he got the idea that he could go down to Cincinnati to the riverboats and he could gamble this month's rent. And he had a chance of making, of, of coming home with not only this month's, but next month's. He was going to go down, he's going to make money on his gamble. And according to Glenn Watts, any time, like the basketball, you know, just take the chance, take that chance, you know. But in this guy's uh, situation, he actually lost his money. <coughs> and so he did not have this month's rent, and he did not <coughs> have next month's rent. And that particular individual ended up uh, losing his home for his family, and he did end up in a mental institution for a while. So, you know, just going for it is not always the best advice. Uh, and I personally may be considered to be a person of uh, low risk tolerance. Uh, I take certain types of risks, but I'm uh, kind of financially, I'm conservative. Uh, somebody who would gamble the money we have now, because uh, maybe in, in a kind of, you know, the, the chance that you're taking with this <coughs> development is a long shot, you know, that's back to the basketball thing. It's a long shot, but you got money riding on it. This is an actual money risk. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I would consider that foolish myself, because I'm not a gambler. I would consider it foolish to risk that kind of money. Um, I would also consider it, when you're using somebody else's money, to be unethical, uh, which is, this is what you're doing. This is the, they're using our money for their project, uh, and they may very well lose it. It's a long shot gamble. Uh, now I come to find out that it may even be illegal because it turns out that other places have done this enough times that it has caused enough trouble that it has gone to court and the Ohio Supreme Court has determined that it's actually not legal for your, your village government to um, risk, gamble with taxpayers' money on something where there is no guarantee of return. It's just not legal. And it's the <coughs> civics group versus the uh, city of Warren uh, Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Other comments? Taki? Hello, the tension is high. How's everybody? Taki Marolakos. I would just like to reiterate uh, my opposition to public financing uh, of the CBE. Uh, I have no particular view as to the earlier plat vote as such. Uh, I would like to state that uh, I think there is a consensus uh, in the village of Yellow Springs about the idea of having a referendum. I don't know what the views of many people here are. Uh, I'd like to urge uh, everyone to sort of uh, consider that idea seriously. I hope council, uh, I heard the president of council uh, mention that idea at the beginning, beginning of her remarks. Uh, I applaud her for that. I think we should move ahead with the idea of a referendum on the public financing portion of this. Uh, and in the spirit of cooperation, I would urge council to uh, itself take the initiative and propose the referendum for the November election. I hope that's something that you will seriously consider between now and the second reading of this bill. Uh, and uh, as you know, there was already a petition circulated uh, during the earlier stage of this discussion. I won't uh, reiterate the arguments uh, that transpired then, uh, but there were sufficient signatures collected at that point. Uh, and in addition, uh, I think that there will be more signatures collected now. So I think that we should do that. Let's have a referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Chrissy? Chrissy Cruz. I just wanted to point out after especially your comments about Sierra putting together this document about Village Council has been supportive of the CR group and the CBE proposal in the past. Um, I keep hearing this over and over again, but I also remember hearing for so long that we, it wasn't going to cost the village anything. 
it was supposed to be this wonderful thing that was going to be done <coughs> for us, and it was going to be funded by developers and grants, and so yes, everybody was supportive. We've been supportive for years, why wouldn't we be? But this is a totally different game now. Now they're asking us for a big chunk of money, and we're supposed to still be just as happy about the whole idea, and they've already borrowed a bunch of money that they have not made even one penny of repayment. So I just want to point that out because um, I think it's a fallacy to keep saying that we have been supporting this project for all these years. Yes, we have supported the CBU project and the, the economic growth in the community. Nobody could be against that. But again, we were told all along it wasn't going to cost us anything. This is a completely different ballgame now. Thank you, Chrissy. Other comments? Oh, Matt? You can see me, but I'm back here. Okay. I, well, do Matt and then whoever it is back there. Okay. Hannah. Okay. Matt Carson um, The Creative Memories building sold for about $7 per square foot, I believe, and it's being rented for around 3 or $4 per square foot. No new construction could possibly compete with that kind of price. Um, the university is moving out of that building. Um, so, I mean, this pretty much makes the entire project a wash, but since you guys are kind of insisting on this, I guess we're going to have to bring it to referendum. I suggest that you guys just put that forward as, uh, as, as it stands right now because um, it would save us all a lot of time and a lot of money, and we'd like, rather be working on things like uh, other projects that are more progressive and perhaps spending time with our families instead. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, Hannah? And um, I come before you today to ask you again to consider that while we do need to come up with a plan for economic development, sustainability, a way to uh, assure ourselves uh, a good quality of life here for our business owners that it do exist and our citizens to see that the CBE is a business park is not a viable plan. Um, we cannot be competitive with surrounding areas that are more closer to, or that are closer to highways, have greater access to all kinds of um, road infrastructure um, and, and easeability. So I just, I just want to continue again. I don't think that this is, I don't think this is the plan for us. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Other comments? Richard? And then Roy after Richard. Richard Lapides, second time at the mic. Uh, I want to be more nuanced about what I said and what others are saying. Very competent people are have been uh, shepherding the CV for many years. There's no question of it. And I believe nothing, no investment, public or private, is without risk. There, of course, are always risks. It's actually about reality. There are risks. I also think that an approach to this has to take into consideration the amount of time and the return on investment yield of such a project. I think it's highly likely that actually making good on this investment will probably be begin in about 10 years. I'd be delighted if it was eight. I'd be gobsmacked if it was six. Okay, so as long as all of us understand how the game is played, what the odds are, what the marketplace is about, we can attenuate the risk by lowering our expectations. And in fact, it's certainly true, as everybody in the room thinks, that we need other means of supporting our tax, uh, 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 building our tax base. Otherwise, we, we will become uh, a self-gated community, which is not a very good idea either. So I'm trying to talk about time and risk in this second statement. Thank you. Thank you. Roy. Uh, Roy Qualls. Um, that hasn't changed. So uh, <laughs> first of all, I just want to correct the record. Uh, <clears throat> my company actually rents space in the Creative Memories building. Uh, so I know what we pay for rent, and it is many times more than 3 or $4 a square foot. Uh, I also was told by the physician that Joe uh, occupied the space, what he pays, and he pays more than we do. So I think that uh, we would be very careful about figures that we put out there and make sure that people are speaking from what they actually know. Uh, not to say that there aren't uh, spaces on that property that might go for that, I don't know. 
but the, the Class A office space that uh, EHDS occupied um, certainly goes for many more times than that. Uh, I would agree that, um, you know, all investments, all efforts uh, are, uh, have some element of risk and that the time horizon that I'm interested in thinking about for the well-being of this village is 50 years, okay? What's going to be here in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? I've lived in the village for about 28, 27, 28 years, and that's the, the time that it's take, taken the, um, uh, the economy to decay. So, um, you know, I'm not looking for a quick fix. I'm looking to plant seeds, to get things there, to start some creative thoughts, to see if Yellow Springs can be competitive to the east and the west coast as knowledge intensive industries, as sustainable, uh, as a hub of sustainable thought. Um, and, uh, you know, these aren't my ideas, these are things that people have told me. Um, and I know that if we don't do something, then virtually nothing will happen. And we're coming to the point where we're going to start spending, uh, make, taking steps that will op make real obligations. And uh, I am also sensitive to the need for uh, public accountability of funds. And I think that the, the process that we engender uh, to move forward will take all that into consideration. So. Um, I think that this is just the next step of a process. Um, I'm not alarmed about it, but then again, I'm not afraid of the future. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Other comments? Uh, Kate. Hi, Kate Hamilton. Um, I just wanted to do sort of like a cliff notes from what I've been hearing. So it's 15 years, this process. Uh, there's no major investors, so CR is asking for tax dollars. Uh, funding was lost because of not moving forward. Uh, zoning wasn't done properly. There's been no comprehensive business plan done until these last few weeks when they're scrambling. Uh, so we should give a million of our tax dollars to them. And. I say go ahead and do the CB, but not with my tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Dan, did I see you? Uh, yeah, I'm Dan Reyes, and I don't want to repeat too much of what's been said already, but it, uh, it occurs to me that some attention really should be paid to the uh, economic context that we're considering doing this in. And this has come up in discussion before, the first time that the uh, funding for the for this project was discussed in council chambers, uh, was interestingly in a context, uh, a, a time context when uh, Dayton Daily News and Dayton Business Journal were reporting on Dayton and the Miami Valley uh, being a national leader in vacancy. Uh, just recently, within the last couple of weeks, our neighbors to the north, Springfield, have reported that they, for their size of city, are a national leader in declining population. Uh, so I, I think it's, that's not to say that these things are Yellow Springs. We've been actually doing better than our neighbors during the same time. We've been holding our ground. Uh, and I think a lot of that goes to the careful deliberation we do and the work we do together as a community. I, I guess I am a concerned a bit that some of the discussion about this legislation uh, is a, a kind of push ahead because almost like we don't have another idea. And I wish we would have a good idea before we rush ahead, uh, before we step forward, and have some sort of idea of what this will end up rather than um, you know, hoping it will fill in if we get the momentum going. So I, in, in that regard, it concerns me a bit that there's been some discussion uh, about moving this ahead, uh, you know, even uh, the back and forth, which I think has happened from from a couple different perspectives, uh, that you know maybe we should throw this to a ref referendum, which is kind of turning it into a political issue when we're trying to say, uh, trying really, if we're serious about this, to solve a social and economic issue. And, and I wish we would spend more time uh, trying to come up with a plan 
that adds up before we um, decide to vote on it. So I guess in that regard, I, I would urge you folks to uh, consider taking that time rather than, than moving ahead quickly on this. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Other comments? I'll bring it back to council table. Um, to, uh, what? A minute. Right. A minute. Um, just for clarification, the reason why we had good working class jobs in this town was because there was a long working class struggle for manufacturing jobs to be well paid jobs. Um, the way we did that was through legislation, raising wages, and through union struggle. Okay, so it's not that manufacturing just pays more automatically. Service industry jobs could pay better, okay? But we have to fight for that. It's not one of those things that businesses just give up. So that's really what's going on here is that you know, the, the jobs that we do have don't pay well because they don't have to. You know, that's, that's why we have low-paying jobs. Thank you, Matt. Uh, bring it back to council table. Um, I want to clarify a few things. Um, this, just Community Resources is a nonprofit organization that has no staff. They have no independent funds to finance this project. Um, they did, they actually did bring a lot of money to the table. They brought over a million dollars in private and public funding to this project um, that, that, has, that they were working on from the time that it, it from its inception. So, so community resources as a, as a um, nonprofit um, organization has actually contributed significantly to this project. There is still $400,000 or $500,000 on the table from the Army Corps of Engineers for this project. Um, and they, they continue to, to work to look, look for opportunities. Um, and it is a partnership when, when we, we're the ones, the Village of Yellow Springs accepted the, the grants that we received. CR didn't accept those grants. So when we accepted those grants, there was good faith that we were going to go forward on this project or we shouldn't have accepted the grants in the first place. So um, I, and, and just to, to clarify the referendum, referendum is a citizen initiative. So a referendum is not something that would come from council. Uh, an initi and, and a referendum is basically to oppose a piece of legislation that, that council has adopted via ordinance. Um, an initiative is something that citizens can bring to council and say that they would like to see this happen. So um, what, um, you know, what I think council is interested in is if there is strong enough public opinion and, and a strong enough public push to for this to go to referendum we're supportive of that and that's why we're we're moving forward with this schedule and and this legislation because we feel it is the um, it, it is the legislation that will enable that referendum to happen if citizens so choose any other comments <coughs> Ann. Um. I support the concept of the CBE. I think that it's important for us to have uh, space for businesses to expand, to grow, to come to Yellow Springs. Um, and um, this topic came up just as uh, Brian and I were newly elected to council and we sort of jumped into it at, at, at the time when I first started thinking about it, I was thinking about it from a point of view of my experience of uh, being nonprofit housing director. And my initial feeling was, well, if my organization were taking this on, would I make this step at this point? And my sense was, no, I wouldn't. I didn't feel there was enough preparation. However, at that time, I also talked to a number of people in the community who I respected and uh, I felt that uh, politics is different than, be, than, than running a nonprofit organization and sometimes there's a window of opportunity that you can grab. And um, so uh, at that point I was supporting funding the CBE and then we ran into the problems. But I was also involved with a small group of some of the people from CBE in which we talked about having an educational program which I supported for the community to 
really understand what this was about. That didn't happen. Um, and then we came to the budget. And then I learned that uh, we were facing a quarter of a million dollar deficit in our operating budget, which concerned me greatly and still does. And now we are faced with this conundrum. That's all, I don't know if it's a catch-22, but uh, so we're, we have a, we're facing a quarter of a million dollar operating budget this year. We have no reason to think, I have no reason to think that uh, the following years, the next say five years, will be any different, any better <coughs> than that. And to add $80,000 for those five years would just increase that deficit. And the reason why we have that deficit, in some part anyway, is because we have lost jobs. <laughs> so, I mean, do we put this money out there and increase our deficit in the hopes of getting jobs? because we've lost that job. That's sort of uh, one way of looking at this. Um, where I am now, if I, I would propose tabling this vote would be what I would like to see, because on the one hand, I do support this. On the other hand, I feel there are a number of things that I would want to see before we move forward. And um, the things that, well, as I said, the deficit budget really concerns me. And to go to, to move forward with this with this deficit I'm just not comfortable with I'm also not comfortable bringing in a new manager in the middle of this thing which I assume will result in a referendum um, I think it's too much to expect a volunteer organization for all of the work that community resources has done and I've been on that organization I think that the task of developing uh, this business park is going to take money. It's going to take someone who's being paid, and that's most likely going to need to come from the village, I think. We don't have that person right now. I don't feel comfortable moving forward without the village really committing itself <coughs> to that in some way. Um, we've talked about having a designated uh, uh, CIC, which would put the village much closer in much closer relationship to this project and we've tabled that decision until the new manager comes on to talk about I feel like we need to have that decision that conversation and we need to make that decision I feel that the village needs to have a economic development plan with some teeth in it the economic sustainability group came up with a sustainability plan which was more or less approved by council I guess but it's nothing that's been acted on there are no dates there are no times there's no what I'll say teeth in it I also would like to see some local investors as has been suggested at least th some interest from some local investors that we want to see this happen um, and a business plan for the for the park so at this point well, the other thing is, I, I don't really think that the village will be served by having a referendum. Yes, it puts it in a political arena. Um, there are clearly a number of people that don't support this. There are people that do. Maybe it's 50-50. Uh, e either way, I don't, whether a referendum wins or loses, I don't feel the village wins from that process. So uh, what I'm saying is I would like to see, and the village has not done what it needs to do, so I am not faulting community resources. The village needs to make some significant steps for an economic development plan, and <coughs> we, need to, we need to decide are we going to be in this game or not, and w we really haven't made that decision, I don't think. So that, that's why, if I had my way, <laughs> which I'm only one, uh, I would table this. Um, so first of all, I think we've been very methodical in this process, especially since the beginning of the year. I don't think we're rushing into anything. So to me, I, I think there are kind of two things that we're looking at tonight. Um, first of all, I feel that uh, a referendum or an initiative probably does serve uh, a very important purpose from everything that I've heard for the last, well, since the, the election last year. Um, 
and I mentioned this in our last meeting, I, I agree that certain things need to happen. For example, uh, we do need to have a, uh, a up-to-date um, economic development plan that we can actually implement. And to that extent, if we know as a community that the CBE is going to be a part of that through the vote, then we can figure that piece out um, once that has been determined. Uh, secondly, I do think that that ties with the designated CIC idea. I think we need a group that looks at economic development as a whole for the village. The CBE is certainly a piece of that, but we also have to think about how that works with downtown and how that works with um, supporting the businesses that we have now and, and how that relates to um, IT uh, initiatives and that sort of thing. And I definitely agree that before we spend any money on the CBE that we have to have, I'm going to call it an execution plan. Uh, the strategy plan, which I've already worked on and some other people have contributed to, <coughs> a business plan, but basically all the things that execute that. And I, I, a lot of us have been talking about the idea of a feasibility study that would be professionally done, as Richard Lapides referred to. Um, but again, I don't think it makes sense to do all those things or invest that time and money if we aren't committed as a community to doing that. So this is why I think everything that we've done since the beginning of the year has led up to what I think most citizens want. And that's why tonight, I'm not focusing as much about how we're going to make the CBE work. I need to figure out, first of all, is this the charge that the community still has? I think this was the charge back in November, and that's why I've stuck it out. But I think we have to figure that piece out. And then we've always been a creative community. We will figure out the other pieces if that is what we want to do. Me too. <laughs> I mean, Brian, I mean, what Brian said, everything Brian said, I agree with, and I'm sorry for jumping in, but since he, before the other two, but since um, I, I agree with so much of what he said, um, I, I think I don't need to repeat it. Um, but I think it's interesting that um, I don't think in any other situation anybody would have ever thought a college um, would, could actually reinvent itself and be looking at accredit reaccreditation in a couple of years. So if you look at what, it, it's interesting that we, that we don't think we can make the Center for Business and Education a success, that we don't think we can fashion it about Yellow Springs with Yellow Springs people and, and, and a, in a fashion that we would be proud of and that would suit our community, but yet we were confident of Antioch College and we were we were right about that so I think we are a creative community we are a community people do want to be here we have EnviroFlight that basically came out of nowhere to be in Yellow Springs because they wanted to be in a creative community um, Yellow Springs Brewery homegrown home in, in more ways than one and and you know that's an, an, another incredibly exciting company there is an energy about Yellow Springs that people here that we can feed for the people that live here but also people want people want to be here and they want an opportunity and but unfortunately I get phone calls I I, I have very few places to tell them 888 Dayton Street is a great opportunity, but it doesn't serve everything. It's a multi-tenant building. You can't put some uses in that building. So, so zoning restrictions um, don't make that a feasible structure for every, for every um, type of tenant. So um, the CBE is just another, another tool in the toolbox. It's another opportunity for the community. Um, and we, we and, I, and I also agree with Brian about the, especially about the feasibility studies. I'm looking into some op options for that to do some serious feasibility studies. Um, I think that the draft of the economic sustainability plan that the um, economic S sustainability commission did and that council accepted. I, I don't know that I'd say we adopted it. We, it was a little. We were a little. Um, shaky on that one but it is a great document I just reread it it's a great document and forms the, a great basis for an economic development plan for the village so if we if we add the layer on top 
of a very specific feasibility study for the CBE. I think we have the tools we need. That can happen over this period of time if there is a referendum. We can't do anything to move forward at all if there's a referendum. So um, I, I see a lot of work to be done in that period of time. Um, well, I've, I, um, I feel like my mind hasn't changed. I've made it uh, fairly clear that I, I don't support um, using pu public funds for this project. Um, and I think I was especially, um, uh, I think Richard's first point, uh, Richard Lapidi's first point about um, using caution, uh, particularly when we're working with tax dollars, um, is something that governments have to take extremely seriously. And um, so that's, uh, that's where I stand. Thanks, Lori. Any other comments, Jerry? Okay. Yes, Ken? I think the Charter gives me the right to speak even though I don't have a vote. <laughs> and to quote Chris Christopherson, this is my last meeting, freedom's just another name for nothing left to lose. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to speak my mind. Uh, I, I disagree with Mary Ann. I see this ordinance as a catalyst. I see it as a, a, a way to give people who are opposed to this an opportunity to put it to the public for a vote. I'm a bureaucrat. I personally support this project, but the last thing I want to do is impose something on this community that it doesn't want. So let's have the referendum. It's council's job. If council had the courage and the will to act instead of waffling and evading and so on, um, we wouldn't need a referendum. Um, so I hear my bosses, but I'm casting. <laughs> um, I, I have a Danish friend, and he said to me one time, "You know, Denmark should be a third world country. We have uh, we have no mineral wealth. Uh, the soils are mediocre. The climate is lousy. We only have one thing nobody else has. That's the Danes." And we have the people of Yellow Springs, and that's a huge resource. And that's what businesses are looking for these days, are people and skills and, and, and people who want to move things forward. And that's a great selling point for this community. Um, I agree with a lot of what Richard Lapidus said, but I can also say that there's another trend out there that is so common it's gotten a name. It's called reshoring as wages in China have gone up, as environmental concerns in China have increased, as transportation costs have gone up, jobs are coming back to the United States, some of those manufacturing jobs we lost. Maybe we'll see them, maybe we won't. Uh, nobody says this is a sure thing, but there are some things working in our favor. Um, last couple of points I'd like to make are, Ohio's very unusual. I'm not aware of another state where local income taxes are paid where you work and not where you live. And that's a huge, that's why we're doing economic development. Yes, the taxes the companies pay are important, but the income taxes on their employees are huge. That's why this community and its current suite of services, the beautiful library, the swimming pool, the parks, this community center we're sitting in, were paid for by other people who lived in Springfield or Fairborn or Lebanon and came here to work and paid their municipal income taxes here. So we, we, we were enabled, and now it's sort of time to join a 12-step program and do something for ourselves. And uh, that's the way I see that. Um, the last point I'd like to make is uh, we're, we're not just in the tax levying business, we are also in the utility business in a big way. Uh, we have the usual water, sewer, and garbage collection, but we also sell electricity. And first of all, that's a great development tool. And secondly, we've lost about half of our customer base when the industry's moved out of town. I believe Vernay used to take like a third to 40% of all of our water and electricity, and they're gone. What that means is when we have to, the, some of those costs are variable with the amount of power and the amount of water, but a lot of those costs are fixed, and when you have to spread those fixed costs over a smaller base, all of our rates go up. We just raised water rates 30%. They're going to go up some more because we've just ta tapped the surface. We've got to build a new plant. We've got to do new, new distribution. Water rates are going to be a huge disincentive for anybody. If you're talking about affordability, we need those customers. 
Um, and I'll stop at that point. Thank so. you, Kent. Um, ready to take a vote? Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Askland? No. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? No. Wintrow? Yes. Uh, next, we have um, reading of resolution 2014-17, approving funding for 2014 mosquito mitigation and eradication project in concert with Green Environmental Coalition. And I know many of you are going to want to leave now, and that's totally fine. Just remember, we have to leave the door open, and so if you want to have conversations, please have them downstairs. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. You mean they don't want to stay for the mosquito? I, I think the mosquito thing is interesting. I'm very <laughs> glad Vicki is here for this. It's, uh, it's a great innovation in, and the right way to deal with mosquitoes, I think. Uh, it's the prime the pump, the prime the pump, so to speak. Let's wait for Richard to sit down <laughs> <laughs> or leave the room. <laughs> yeah, Judy, could you right, go yes. ahead, please? Whereas some serious diseases are transmitted by mosquitoes, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs has collaborated in past years with Green and County Combined Health District, the Green Environmental Coalition, and Antioch College to manage the mosquito problem, and whereas Council desires to continue its efforts to minimize the adverse effects mosquitoes inflict on our residents, now, therefore, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, does hereby resolve that. Section 1, it desires to reassert its efforts to manage and mim minimize the damage to public health created by the presence of mosquitoes in our community. Section 2, to help achieve that goal, it hereby awards a grant of $5,000 to the Green Environmental Coalition. Section 3, it is understood that the Green Environmental Coalition will act as a coordinator or broker, and they may elect to pass through or, or all or part of the grant money to third parties, such as Antioch College, or the Green County Combined Health District. Section 4, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to disperse the subject grant monies at the earliest convenient date. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. OK. Um, I think Vicki is here. She can talk about this briefly. I think we've yeah, um, heard about it last I'll, week. I'll, oh, I was not that at all. to uh, talk about it, but it's a great thing. I think uh, we did a great job last year and mm -hmm. hopefully will again. And um, Savita from Antioch has already started. We went out with her to the glass farm and the health department is already down here. So funded or not, we're rolling. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Vicki. Um, can I, I, this isn't for you, this is, I guess, probably for Kent. How, how does a distribution like this happen? So um, our what kind of, a, of accounting, either before or after, are we, um, do we ask for when we um, give a grant like this? If it's a grant, I don't know. And I won't be here to check up. Who do you, who do you, <laughs> well, you, know, uh, <coughs> you know, actually, uh, we were recently talking about this with the HRC and talking about always getting some kind of invoice. Uh, Melissa was mentioning this, and I mean, I think she could speak more to it, but she has thought it out. Although I guess this is a grant, and I guess what, 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 this, what this legislation says is that we're giving a grant of $5,000 to, to Green Environmental, so I think it's, it's perhaps not the, same, mm -hmm. not the same thing. I think what we would ask then, I think we talked about it at the last meeting, that um, we get some report, obviously we get some reporting back, um, we look at how we can integrate our own staff into the plan so that perhaps we could take it on in the future and um, obviously get a, you know get a, get a final report back and right. and, fully. and how those and, and a, along with a budget of how those funds were were utilized yep. we'll do that. Thank you, Thank you. Um, yeah I, it, it may or may not be that the village staff would take it on or maybe the village staff would be involved um, I it, it might also be that there would be a volunteer group already 
in existence or maybe the schools or the college and so I guess I, I would ask that uh, GEC think about this with the ANAC students during this time period what are some various options that might work for next the next year the next years All right thanks um, any other comments citizens all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, next is um, 2000 resolution 2014-18 approving, approving Heinz Engineering to complete engineering plans for water distribution projects. Hey, whereas the village is in need of engineering design services for two major water distribution projects, one of which has attracted substantial grant support. And whereas the village manager has issued a request for qualifications and two engineering firms have responded. And whereas the village manager has brokered, brokered a composite approach to the project, which assigns primary responsibility to one firm while incorporating some services from the second firm that draw on that company's special competencies. Now the Board Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio does hereby resolve that. Section 1. The proposal of Heinz Engineering LLC to perform the required work for a fee of $98,200 is hereby accepted. Section 2, it is understood as a condition of this award that the elements of this project that especially suit the skill set of the engineering firm of Lockwood, Jones & Beals will be subcontracted to that firm. Section 3, the village manager is hereby authorized and directed to execute an agreement with Heinz Engineering LLC to carry out the work defined in that firm's proposal dated June 4, 2014. Section 4, this resolution shall be in effect from and after its date of adoption. Thank you, Judy. Um, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Kent, I will turn this over to you, please, for discussion. Uh, we, yes, we, we already have a grant to do the loop completion project, and we're coming up on a deadline to get the design done so that it can be bid in a timely manner. So that's part of what's driving this. The other piece everybody knows and understands needs to be done, the bottleneck elimination. And so I've asked that both pieces be done. And uh, again, I think we've picked the, the best way to do it in terms of minimizing costs and in making sure it comes out at the highest quality, gets done in a timely fashion, and so on. I joke, there's the old joke of engineers about, you know, you can have fast, you can have good, or you can have cheap, any two, but not all three. Uh, I really think our engineer, Mike Heinz, does combine all three of those qualities. Uh, but this is a case where uh, one of the staff members, Lockwood Jones and Beals, has more knowledge and information and history and probably more foresight than most other people could bring to the project, and I wanted that incorporated, and so that's why we have a composite. And just to be clear, so this includes, so we, we have two discrete projects that right. we're kind of calling the whole loop completion. So the first one that we got the 400000 grant dollars for from OPWC is for the Corey Street, Livermore, Antioch College area. Yes, downtown and the college. And, and so we have, we have half of the funding for that project. Right. But, but this particular resolution and this contract is actually combining, then there is the other the bottleneck, loop, the bottleneck, right. that, bottleneck that will elimination. actually um, take care of fire flow for the south end of town and then connect into the water towers. Yes. So this is, oh wow. That's all of it. That's exciting. That's exciting what, because what's so great about it, then we'll be ready with that engineering to go after OPWC money mm -hmm. for um, the bottleneck project. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I've already, I've, I've had a little bit of conversation with, with John about how we can, and, and with Kent also about how we can kind of present that proposal in a way that it might be more attractive, um, sound more attractive to OPWC as a, as a joint project and as economic development. Um, I was trying to figure out how much we had originally budgeted for this, just out of curiosity, wanting to compare what... Well, for loop completion, there is a budget, a, a little over 800000 and half of that will come from a grant. We right, but for this, for the, for the engineering, had we, what, what did we... I had no What idea. did we estimate it? I don't think oh, okay. we had an estimate. No. Okay. And did those numbers include, I guess that would be a question, did the, did the contract <coughs> budget numbers include engineering, or was that just for construction? I think it's just construction. Mm, that's... We've got to remember to start putting the design fees and the construction fees because that they basically just get thrown on top of everything. Right. Hmm. So you mean we have estimates for construction without a design? I think oh, it's yeah. a back of the envelope estimate. 
doing X number of feet and okay. so many dollars a foot with no regard for tree removal, rock, you know, all those kinds of details that have to be part of a real design. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Questions from citizens, comments? If there's anybody from the press, I'd emphasize that the correct spelling of Heinz is in the resolution rather than the minute, or than the agenda. Catch up. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, got, he's got a team. Ready, well, nice if we're ready, we'll take a vote. It's okay. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And finally, we have Resolution 2014-19, authorizing <coughs> the village manager to enter in a, into an agreement with Arbor Care for 2014 util utility line clearance of the village. Whereas the village has advertised for bids for the clearance of trees, branches, and vegetation from the electric utility lines in Section 1 of the village, and whereas Arbor Care was the low bidder for this work, having submitted a bid of $96,000 for said services, and whereas the electric department supervisor has, has examined the bid and finds it reasonable and conforming to the bid specifications, now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. That's section one. The village manager is authorized to execute an agreement with Arbor Care for the clearing of trees, branches, and vegetation from the electric utility line easements and rights of way for said utilities in section one of the village, which said agreement shall be in a form approved by the village solicitor. Section two, this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, Kent, um, I don't know if this, does this say where this is, where they're going to be working this year? The specifications did, but I'm not that familiar with it because it was handled by Johnny Burns. The Do you have any idea, area. Jason? I believe it's south, south town. It's, it's on the southern edge. Um, some of the stuff didn't get done the first time around, but this is what he's trying to do. Okay. I have had uh, citizens uh, raising concerns that uh, Arbor Care uh, about the services that they um, destroyed, you know, things like clotheslines and picnic tables, um, and uh, kind of did what the citizens consider not a, a nice job on uh, delicate trees. Um, is there? Uh, I'm not sure. I just wanted to raise this because I've heard it from more than one one citizen uh, concerns about the work that was done. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what to do with that other than to raise it. And if there, I'm, I assume that what citizens should do, if they have trouble with any person or entity that we contract with. They should notify the village and immediately yes. with the with any damage that occurred and on the date and take pictures anything you need to do to document it so that we can hold any contractor accountable hearing about it long after the fact with no clear date there's not a lot we can do about it um, so I guess that's those are my two uh, concerns I would agree I like that and also I would especially since this is most likely in somebody's backyard I would hope that there would be some um, notification ahead of, ahead of time that people know that folks are going to be doing the work um, maybe a week ahead of time schedule or something um, just just for privacy for whatever just so that somebody knows who's wandering around in their backyard and if they want to move something you know and that would be the other thing it, you know our citizens required that would be a question I guess for Johnny and Arbor Care if there are things in the way whose responsibility is it to move so just to make sure all that's coordinated okay. any other comments council mm -hmm. citizens uh, Joan Um, I had this uh, <clears throat> company last year come onto my property without notifying me, come through a locked gate, and essentially just about demolish um, a tree unnecessarily. Um, and so, like Lori was saying, I have real concerns about the quality of care of this particular group. I had another uh, company come in 
and repair the damage to the tree, which cost me about $350. Um, they did not notify me that they were going to be on my property. They came onto my property. This isn't, they're in the right of way. Um, they didn't let me know that they were going to be there. Uh, they came through a gate that is closed. Um, I had just gotten a little dog not too long before that that could easily have escaped out that gate and she didn't know where she lived because I rescued her. Um, and so I have several concerns about the, the company's procedures. <laughs> and I did call the village and called and Kelly Fox came out to talk to me. Um, but I don't know that these issues that I'm raising have been rectified because um, I don't know what you've talked to Arborcare about. But that is my real concern with this organization. And um, like I said, when they were uh, cutting this tree, um, they did not do a good job. And it cost me $350 to repair what they did. Thanks, Thanks Joan. I, I guess I would add to that, Kent, is you know that, that had been a, a pretty long discussion in the past when we, when we um, added our tree trimming program, when we, when we dramatically increased it, that there are standards of um, trimming that, that, mm -hmm. count, that the community expects in the council would would like um, to be instituted and I think but I think people do have to realize I mean these are going through private property and a gate and whatever other damage is done but these are our utility easements so you know the village does have the right and responsibility to do that tree trimming and but it but I do agree it needs to be done in a workmanlike and, a, and in a in a good a good manner any other comments all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda for um, comments from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. If uh, you would like to speak, there, come up to the microphone, state your name, and you have three minutes for comments. Go ahead. Joan. This has nothing to do with trees. Um, uh, and Kent, I noticed that this has to do with the stop sign on my corner, which is uh, West South College and East Dean, and it's where the high school is, and about people who are running the stop sign without even bothering to slow down. Um, and Kent, I noticed that today they've got, um, is it a, what kind of thing did they put up there mm -hmm. uh, that they've secured to the street itself and I'm hoping that that will help uh, get people to at least slow down at the point where they might think about stopping. There are a couple of people who come through that area on a routine basis. One of them has a, um, a black Mercedes that is a, um, a convertible Mercedes and this guy comes screeching around the corner without even bothering to slow down. Now this is an area where there are a lot of kids, even if school is not in session, there are still a lot of children on that corner. And I am very concerned. I have uh, to say that the police patrols have been um, more frequent out there, and hopefully they've got, uh, hopefully they will be irregular enough so that people won't learn to expect when they're going to be there. Um, and I would appreciate, you know, that the police officers are actually stopping people who don't bother to stop and ticketing them. Um, I don't know what else we can do in terms of solutions, but Ken, I want to say thank you for getting uh, some kind of a little barrier there that might... Yeah, a little speed bump, yeah. It's a little speed bump. Oh. Is it going to be on all of the, in front of all the stops? Or is it, today it was just on the... Um, area where you're coming from the north. I think there are three uh, of the, we own three of them. We were going to put one at each okay. point in the intersection. And uh, I think it would be uh, 
citizen's responsibility to come to a stop at that corner and to not go speeding and screeching around the corner because um, I had a cat get killed by some <coughs> speeder and um, I'm concerned that it's not going to be just animals but that there's going to be a little kid out there um, you know because there are a lot of kids that do play in that street thank you thanks Joan anything else Rick Uh, Rick Donald, yeah. Um, one of my main concerns with the CBE has always been that eventually, um, eventually that retail will somehow work its way in there. And reading in the paper, I, I found out that it already has in the form of a food truck out there. Now this might sound sort of... Uh, silly, but this is how retail, this is how retail happens. This is how it happens in, in a small community. It, it doesn't happen in a big way. Uh, we, we, we supposedly have a comprehensive plan to, to keep retail in town, uh, to keep it out of the western edge of town. But here's an example where it's just a little thing. It's not going to amount to much. It's going to be a part-time thing. But still, it's retail. Where the comprehensive plan has specifically said they don't want retail. We don't want retail. And so, and I know I went on and read in the paper that the intent is not to compete with the downtown, but all the people involved in this here and with the CBE, years from now, we all won't be here. Um, we will lose the in Today we have the right intent, but that intent will be lost, but the, the, the exception will remain. And, and these things grow. It's incremental, it's hard to see. In the little town I was in, we were all busy with our lives, and. And one day you look back and you know, how did that happen? How did that retail happen? Well, this is how it happens, and I think we need to be careful. Um, and one of the ways we can be careful, just another thing, very quickly, I don't think a food truck is a viable business there. And when you don't have a viable business, pretty soon they come back and they want more. Well, we need something else. We need to park this truck near the road maybe one of these new roads to get people coming in, but also people going by. And this is how it happens. And, and I'm, I'm ashamed that, that I let it happen, and I'm ashamed that this village let it happen. So. Um, the, the distinction with, you, you can sit down. Uh, the, dis the distinction here is that AUM is zoned E1, and E1 food trucks are a, a conditional use mm -hmm. in an E1 district. Um, it is, I don't know that, um, they, that it is an approved or a conditional use in the zoning that, that the CBE has. So um, Antioch College could have a food truck because it's E1, and I think they actually requested that they that actually first came, I think, from Antioch College. That's how it got to be um, considered as a conditional use in E1. So that is the distinction as to why it is there and why it was approved, because it's part of the zoning code. Yeah. It wasn't an exception given to them. It was part of our zoning code. And, and there's always been some retail. I think Antioch University itself has a bookshop where you can buy sweatshirts and... Not, not anymore, but... Not anymore? Nope. Okay. You have to buy online. Okay, I know Antioch Publishing Company had retail in their office when they were open. Mm -hmm. So I used to go in and buy bookmark, book plates. Uh, any other citizen concerns, Richard? Uh, Richard Lapides. I would like to, to speak to the strengths of the village very briefly. It's clear that globally, and particularly in first world nations, all repetitive 
cognitive and manual tasks are being eliminated from industrial operations, commercial operations really of any kind, retail operations of any kind for that matter. Because the digitalization of commerce and the, uh, the advances in artificial intelligence allow any routines to be dealt with in other ways that are far more capital intensive, far less labor intensive. And that's one of the reasons that middle class incomes are being destroyed globally, not just in the United States. That's going to only accelerate. So, interestingly enough, I think that plays to Yellow Springs' strengths because the place has long been attractive to people who are creative. That's why many of us are, who presume to be creative live here. Okay? So refocusing some of the ideas that are troubling right now to the American economy and to this village could put, put Yell Springs at a considerable advantage. But we shouldn't kid ourselves about recovering by any means at all. Any task that is routine, be it manual or cognitive, because nobody's going to have them. They're not going to exist anymore. And that inflection point is now. It'll accelerate really rapidly now. And there's all kinds of information about it. So when we imagine jobs for our community, we should look at our strengths, which actually play to the situation, and not look nostalgically at our history, which was about what are the kinds of jobs, often, that are no longer in existence and will continue to be discontinued at a very rapid and accelerating rate. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Anything else? Karen? And I don't see that any place on the, on the agenda, so I'm going to use it now. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, mm. we found ourselves in a situation where we were without leadership and for our day-to-day -day operations and so forth. And we kind of discussed amongst ourselves, you know, how were we going to continue? And Kent Bristol's name came up. And Kent agreed to step in and, and help us through a, a real trying a time that we had. And he got us to where we are, which I think is, is we're in fairly good shape, but uh, I don't see any place else on the agenda before our TV audience goes to sleep uh, <laughs> and so forth. But, but me personally, I, I'm going to stand up and, and give yeah. it. You know, we may be old and so forth, but we still have a gift to give. And I think uh, Kent gave a gift to us in, in uh, helping us uh, continue on as a, a functioning, uh, not only council, but a functioning community. And, and I, we, we owe uh, Kent a big day. Thank you very much. Yeah, yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Paul. Paul Hemendroff, I agree. Um, <laughs> pleased that you tonight started the process of fixing the bottleneck. Uh, the water supply to the south side of town in case of a fire has been a problem for decades. And this is a great first step. In relation to that, I would propose that you think about a park from about Allen Street down to uh, maybe the edge of town. There's a sliver of land there between the Route 68 and the old interurban line that uh, is a potential for making a nice entrance to town. When we had some exercises in the uh, visioning process, one of them was, what are your favorite places in town and what are your least favorite? The overall winner for least favorite was the junkyard, but that area, it's a very ugly part of town and it can be fixed because most of the problem is on village land. So consider that when you get to fixing the bottleneck that you landscape it in the form of an attractive area. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs>
Looks like we have no more citizen comments. Um, next on our agenda is special reports. Um, I see we have Ellie Ferguson here from Home Inc. to make a report on um, housing assessment. Yes. Oh, exactly. That has nothing to do with it, but does it? That's. I thought that's our council table line, but that's okay. No, I apologize. That's going to be a little bit of an awkward orientation. I have to try to make eye contact. Everybody, Everybody has to deal with this. <laughs> yeah, it's not great. I think we need to move to the other side. Because it's. It's, yeah. it's just supposed to take about ten minutes. I hope. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ellie, how long how long do you expect this to take? Seven minutes. Okay. Ten minutes good. Max. So I guess as it's warming up, I can introduce myself. Um, I've been working with Homey for the past year. You need to speak into the microphone, sorry. sorry. I've been working with Yellow Springs Homey for the past year on issues related to poverty, um, particularly related to housing. And so Home Inc. is a nonprofit um, whose mission is to strengthen community and diversity in Yellow Springs, Miami Township um, through per permanently affordable and sustainable housing through the community land trust model. And so I've spent part of this last year, one of the projects as a VISTA, um, working and researching a housing needs assessment and kind of that framework. And so I do appreciate the opportunity to come today and present to council. I don't know what this is. Yeah. Move it physically. Thank you. OK. <laughs> so anyway, I've been researching this framework, and I know that in town, there is a lot of anecdotal um, and sort of common sense understandings of what people of different income levels are struggling with rents, with housing costs, um, quality of homes, and home prices are rising faster than local incomes. That said, I think the value of a formalized need assessment includes developing priorities and having tools to bring investment into the community to improve our infrastructure and meet the needs of the community as a whole. So a community housing needs assessment is primarily a tool um, for collecting, organizing, and analyzing information specific to individual communities. And at first, you know, it begins with identifying that there is a problem. And that's typically attributed to what we call the affordability gap, the difference between re residents can't afford versus the actual cost of living in a place. Um, so it brings up questions, you know, who can and cannot afford to live here, What's our community, again, affordability gap based on gross income? Um, it also is taking into consideration demographic shifts. So, you know, what did our village look like 30, 40 years ago? Where are we now? And then what can we project into the future to better serve our community? In addition to demographic shifts, um, it also examines whether the quality, condition, and caring costs of current village housing stock meets the needs and priorities of community, all the residents in the community. Um, so a housing needs assessment can help to gather data related to both market rate and an affordable housing to establish local priorities um, and also could conceivably be linked to larger economic needs assessment looking at jobs, economic development as well. So typically housing needs ass assessments are broken down into these six categories. Um, again, it's dependent. Generally, it's gonna, you're going to look at population and demographic trends. You're going to look at rental housing, home ownership, um, and then dependent on the communities and kind of populations there, you can look at senior housing, special needs, and then as well as professional and workforce housing. So right now, according to HUD, families who pay more than 30% of their income for housing are considered cost burden and may have difficulty affording necessities such as food, clothing, transportation and medical care. An estimated 12 million renter and homeowner households now pay more than 50% of their annual incomes for housing. So a family with one full-time worker earning a minimum wage, maybe just above minimum wage, cannot afford local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. So again, this, you know, it's kind of 
and when you're beginning to conceptualize a needs assessment, you begin just with a framework and questions. You know, what do we want to look at? So, are residents employed, underemployed? Um, what do workers in our community earn on average? You know, what are those breakout groups? Um, as well as displacement, if any has occurred, and what correlations are related to that displacement. Do we see displacement of certain demographics with the rising of housing costs? What does that look like? So in terms of rental housing, some of the questions in addition to the age, condition, size, cost of rentals, um, what is the relationship of rents to local wages? How's that changed over time um, for home ownership? How old is the community's home ownership stock? What quality conditions exist? How much buying power do local renters have? What types of professionals cannot and can't afford housing in our community? Um, for senior housing, is there adequate market rate and or subsidized senior housing to meet the demand current and projected? And for workforce housing, are there types of industries such as college staff, um, YSI employees who experience an affordability gap? Perhaps not. Um, maybe there is. Is there sufficient market rate housing to meet the needs of these people working here? Another area is um, the artists live workspaces, which I believe the Village and Homing commissioned a feasibility study recently with Coupa, which is the Center for Urban Planning and Administration, which showed demand for artists live work loss. The study also showed that units would require some affordability subsidy to make them affordable to the artist population that currently resides here. So the goal of the housing needs assessment is to help focus the community's efforts on its most critical local problems. At a minimum, the housing needs assessment process may identify alternatives that might be more effective than the most obvious solution to a local housing problem. The local government's goal for the resultant strategies may be to ensure that decent, affordable housing is available to meet the needs of specific targeted households. So that, depending on what the study would show, that could be very, very low income. So households that are below 50% of area median income. Um, this could be artists. This could be any number of things. So in collecting this data, it's primarily made up of census data. Um, the James A. McKee group, working with Kupa, did a study that has already been on to compile a lot of the data that you would need to look at. Um, in addition to census data or quantitative data, um, it's also, I would say, really important to include things such as surveys and focus groups um, with community members. It's important for community members to feel like they're part of that process to provide input and to be heard. Um, additionally, more recent housing needs assessments have been including GIS components, which is fantastic because then you can have a visual model and representation of all of this data to use, and it can be a very powerful tool that you continue to add to over time. So, projections, so as much as we're looking <coughs> at the past to look at changes and displacement and to see where we are currently, it's also really important that there are projections for planning for the future, um, conservatively, of course. So projections are made based off of historical trends and the development capability factor, which reflects the expectation that future housing unit demand and affordability challenges will be concentrated in those communities with sufficient infrastructure to accommodate this development. Affordable housing remedies have traditionally been categorized into two approaches, one being demand side solutions, the other being supply side solutions. A demand side approach would attempt to make housing more affordable from the perspective of the individual household homeowner. So this would include things like mortgage refinancing. From the supply side perspective, affordable housing can be addressed by increasing the supply of affordable units or whatever a housing needs assessment would show there's need for. Um, this could be done through planning, through zoning, regulatory changes, or through incentives for developers. Planning departments of most Municipalities agree that supply-side approach is the option over which county and governments can make the most influence, an avenue through which they can make a substantial impact on their communities. So, in terms, you know, a, a housing 
a housing assessment would you know could potentially show maybe in theory that there's no need for development or it could show a number of things that would not necessarily appear anecdotally either and so these things could include senior housing the need for multi-generational multi-family homes rentals a number of things um, specific outcomes might include taking on projects and programs similar to the Cemetery Street project uh, and developing official policy and planning documents such as a neighborhood stabilization plan. Plans help groups like local agencies such as Homing secure outside capital to invest in the community and by showing public support and meeting public goals. So and then finally I've included which I do have copies of this PowerPoint for council if you're interested but these are two examples of housing needs assessments that were conducted within the last five years in communities roughly a little bit bigger than Yellow Springs but about the same size and it gives an overview of how they performed it you know how they developed measurements that go in depth and what I covered as well as Wright State Coupa program Mary Winning there is a fantastic resource as well for that so thank you. I do appreciate can, you. Can we ask you questions? Please. Um, okay, I've got a few. Um, is there your your focus? Obviously, you're with Home Inc., so your focus was on affordability. Is there any reason that a housing needs assessment couldn't be broader and include an assessment of all different types of housing needs in the community? A housing, yeah, absolutely. A housing assessment. So when I was looking at frameworks, just because I was coming from the vantage point of working with our mission is aligned with affordability um, and it was going to be much smaller in scope than I think something that the village would take on we were focused on those questions but a housing needs assessment should be looking at everything if possible it should be as in-depth and as broad as possible and absolutely looking at market rate homes and say. and do you have recommendations on who you know a number of groups that could do it or and also what it would the approximate cost be I can't comment on cost um, and for the research that I did we were just hoping because cost may it, it just depends on after sitting down I would imagine you all and conceptualizing the different issues and subjects that you're wanting to touch on um, you know we we were planning to go with Wright State because there's students who would have do that research um, at considerably low cost as a part of their research so I can't really provide you with names of organizations or with the cost of what that would look like okay. unfortunately. Um, well, I'd, I'd just like, I don't think I have questions, but thank you, first of all, for coming. And um, I had asked Ellie to come because um, I think when we're thinking about economic development, we also want to be thinking about housing. And while we can have anecdotal uh, evidence, I mean, I, I think most of us could sort of say the kind of housing that we think Yellow Springs needs to have. But by doing an assessment, especially when we have 30 acres of the glass farm, which hopefully will, I would like for us to start talking about how we want to utilize that land and certainly a fair amount of it I think would go for housing, having some kind of assessment. And, and I think you mentioned that it's good to have some surveys of residents. Did you yeah, talk? So it, it just, again, it depends, and not to make everything about cost, but also in time and the resources that you have available to you. Um, some, some communities take time and distribute surveys and spend that time analyzing qualitative data, hosting focus groups, and incorporate that into their, their planning and to the general analysis. Um, others don't, just a lot of that is time and return on what you get with that. But I do think that Yellow Springs is unique in the sense that we have a very engaged group of citizens who would, I think, be happy and be engaged in a part of something like this. And um, I, we have the glass farm. We also have our new zoning code, which has liberalized to some extent the options for people in building. And I think having an assessment, looking to the future, wh what do we need? Where do we want to be? And looking at the kind of housing. Do we need more senior housing? Do we need, need more executive housing? Do we need more... Um, what kind of families are we wanting to bring in? What kind of households are we wanting to bring in? And the more we can develop a plan, 
I think we can get developers to come in and develop more easily. The community, I think, will be more supportive, especially when we're doing things on community-owned, village-owned land. And in terms of affordable housing, I think it will really increase our uh, options of getting uh, funding for that as well. well. Getting a housing needs assessment, I think, has been I just finally took it off of my goals because it didn't seem that something that council would support but I could probably pull out my goal statements from years back this is something that I've wanted to do for years so I'm particularly excited about it um, I think it's a perfect public-private partnership we have private organizations Antioch College is looking at a lot of housing issues so I think this is an absolutely perfect private part private public partnership and I am intending to pursue and, and with council to, to potentially bring a proposal to council um, that will put together some ideas for a housing assessment and how it will get paid for and how it will get done. Sounds good. Thank you. So, Thanks, thank you. Hey, Thanks. Good luck. And I think you know somebody that does GIS, right? I do. Yes. Yeah. You, for everybody that doesn't know, Ellie is a high school, is a Yellow Springs High School grad. Yeah. She was on yeah. Luke's baseball team when he was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> and her brother is working, is in Toledo? In Akron. In Akron, doing, doing GIS. So he's, he's a municipal planner. Oh. So. Great. <laughs> um, okay, and I, wanted, I want to add one thing to old business. Um, one item, I have a press release I would like to read uh, about... Um, um, a lawsuit that the village has been involved in and so that will be the last item um, in old business um, next on the agenda is um, s oh I'm sorry we're gonna take a break we're gonna take a five-minute recess Thank you. Thank you. okay ready um, next item of business is the uh, Sutton Farm Improvement uh, Project uh, Jason Hamby is here to talk about that and there were, um, I think that there was information on our table. Yeah, I've give you, given everybody a staple packet okay. as well as a part of some. Uh, basically what the um, front page of this, your packet will include is, um, I've, I've gotten a quote uh, from a gentleman um, that said that he could supply us with this. Um, I know that this is going to go over and we're going to go out, have to go off a bid for this, but this is just to give you an idea of what we're looking at to house all of the equipment and supplies that that uh, the Public Works uh, routinely uses and needs. Um, basically what we're looking at is a building that's uh, 42 feet wide by 160 feet long um, and 16 feet high and that will enable us to house everything that we have currently in our inventory, including our new jetpack machines. Um, currently right now we have nine pieces of machinery sitting out weathering the storm, um, and that is just to include mowers and trucks and equipment. That doesn't include materials that we need laying out on the ground. Um, I know that I, I can't order any PVC piping because we have no place to store it so I'm keeping it out on the ground and it's getting brittle so it's just like flushing money down the drain so um, this building will enable us to house everything that we have outside already um, will allow us to take some of our pieces of machinery that we have in other buildings and let us utilize that area a little bit more effectively um, and this unit will also allow us to um, possibly house our new crew um, building as well. So everything will be contained in one and it will be right near the front gate. So everybody will be right there. Do, do you feel like, uh, I mean, it would seem to me that if you need 10 more or 20 more feet in 10 years, it would be better to build it in now? Does it feel like there's that's that's an ample space so that if we bought another piece of equipment it wouldn't be set sitting out in the storm if we're, you know if, if the configurations change yeah w what this building will allow us to do sorry Lori, um, will 
it'll enable us to park two per bay. Mm -hmm. So we can fit twice as many trucks, twice as many cars, um, or bigger machinery might have to do it. But it'll enable us to pull in um, a trailer full of mowers now instead of leaving them out overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'll allow us to do that as well. So it gives us a lot of room for play as well. Like I said, um, you know, mm -hmm. the um, picture that I have here, mm -hmm. we can remove, and I've already talked to this the gentleman here, we can remove those front two doors and that's where we can supply our crew room. Mm -hmm. We can still have enough space to house everything that we need, piping, machinery, Okay. And so there's doors on both sides so they doors can pull through. Sides. Oh, wow. Yes, sir. Oh, so cool. what we'll do is I've given an aerial mm -hmm. um, view as well. Mm -hmm. So right when you pull in the gate, you take a left and go around, and you can just pull through everything. Yeah. So. And could we make sure also that a copy of this map gets to, to come to land trust because of the easement on the property around there? And that's what I assume the red line is, is showing the protected easement? Yes, that's just. I mean, because right. obviously this is well nicely in the middle. They just wanted to make sure they understood what was happening. Mm -hmm. and, and are you taking down what's what's happening? What's happening now where this building is proposed? Um, that's everywhere our electrical supplies are located. So what what our plan is is to. So move. that's what I'm seeing. I mean, those are but just a bunch of transformers, transformers and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then that's where a couple of our employees park as well. So. Oh. We're not we're not really losing anything. We're actually gaining something because we're moving our electrical equipment out of the public eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's, and it's what about the gas tanks? Is it, that's not in that area, is no, it? No, it's, okay. it's down further towards the other building. Okay. Thanks. Are they still there? Yes. Yep. So is there a plan to still utilize the? It, what will you do with the existing buildings? We'll we'll still have uh, equipment in there as well. Uh -huh. um, mainly. Um, It'll be more for supplies and everything, bringing them, right. bringing them inside. And why 24 doors? What? I mean, what, how did you come up with that number? All of our, out of all of our um, machinery that we have, that's that's what we need. Um, because you can park one or two cars front or front to back and mm -hmm. get them in there, but it's not going to be a useful walkway. Okay. So that's where we came up with that, and, and Johnny and I sat down and came up with a number, and he needs this X amount of spots and X amount of spots for materials, and so do I, and that's where we came up with the, with the 24 doors. Okay. So the double doors is just so you can have, uh, will, the, will the vehicles maybe be pointed back end to each other, and yes. then they can each go out yeah. separate doors? Yeah, okay. you, you can do that as well, or, you know, or, or back it up a little bit. Yes. Well, how, how when you were, how did this process go? Did you and Johnny sit down and sort of think what you needed and then give it to this guy? Or was it a collaborative process with you it, all and the, whoever this guy is? Yeah, it was more of a look around and see how many pieces of machinery that were, you know, neglecting. And I, I mean, you know, you guys thankfully approved uh, me and Johnny to get two new trucks those trucks are sitting outside that's basically all for nothing mm -hmm. even if you get the stainless steel beds it's, it's all for nothing yeah so we've got too many pieces of machinery that are sitting outside that we yeah, can't yeah, house yeah. anywhere that in five years we're going to be coming begging in front of you guys hey yeah. can we no it's all right well you, the case yeah, has been yeah. made yeah. there's no it's, yeah. I just want to make sure it's a big enough that it's it's got room for growth in case Things, things shift so we're not back here again in five years saying we actually need 50 you know 25 more feet no, no. Uh, Go the, ahead. the other thing that, that Johnny and, uh, and uh, Jason looked at was that uh, because of the water and sewer issue mm -hmm. uh, they could refurb a portion of the old uh, storage area in put the uh, crew station and so forth there because we had the septic tank already there that we, we can use and it's a shorter distance from water lines. Which so building is that? This is the, the Quonset Hut, the which Quonset is Hut. to right. the left, the bigger building. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. 
So that, that gives them, gives us They've another, got a set, another, second another, option. Another option. Mm -hmm. to we, we've actually got a couple different options. I mean, you know, the house that is up front, we could essentially refurbish that house mm -hmm. and put all our crew in there. Or we could build something like Jerry was suggesting on top of our extension out of our Quonset hut for the crew room because everything's there. Right. Or we can run a brand new leach field and then run the water line down to that new building. So there's three different options as far as are, the, all right. Are we having any problems with the existing leach field? I mean, is that is the septic? No, it, it just will not handle. If we put a, a crew room in there and keep the bathrooms that we're at now, it won't handle everything. So we'll have to run a new leach field. Okay. Um, you know, the other question I have is about um, is about the design process or, or uh, okay the, the bid process and you know you got you got a bid and you know some general specifications from one um, metal building company that you're then going to have to put out for bid so are we going to have architectural fees on top of this or is this a set of specifications and a and a kind of a speculative design that can actually be sent out? I mean I just you know we're, we've talked about about how much this is going to cost but is there going to be a bunch of design costs and time on top of that uh, from what i'm gathering from this gentleman talking to him nothing there it, it, everything is covered um if you look down here at the bottom there there it's the site prep is, is all on them and all zoning and building permits is all on them but but you're gonna have but it has to go out for bid so yes. so you've got to have a package yes. to give to other bidders um so yeah. that's what that's my question is if he gets the contract cool but what are we going to have to prepare to to go out for bids? Yeah. Well, th this type of building is pretty much a commodity. It is. Yeah. So it's more like you a tell them how big you want it and what characteristics you want. Prefab. And it passes almost. code. Mm -hmm. Will be that'll right. that'll meet the need. So, did they give a cost on this? Yes. Three hundred five. Three hundred five. Three hundred five thousand. Yes. So um, when you know when I I think when we do get I mean we we would want. All of the all of the costs included to make sure, um, uh, you know, s estimated electrical service, you know, complaint. and they do include the zoning and building permits. Good, okay. John, did you have a comment? I mean, I agree totally with what Ken said about it being a commodity building. I mean, there's these types of there's a number of different companies that do this. But what you're essentially putting out the bid is a design build process. And you just need to make sure that your specifications, and I haven't seen the document, so I can't even speak to the details of it there, that the specifications cover everything that needs to be covered, not the way an architect would design a building that you bid, but the, the performance criteria for the building. So it might include things like the performance for um, insulation. Insulation. Or, I mean, yeah. There's a there's a number of things, and so there are some firms, and it might be worth looking at where you don't hire them the way you would hire an architect, but you hire them to make sure that this performance specifications will give you an apples to apples comparison among the different uh, design build contractors. Um, so, that, and the, I've been looking at this also from the standpoint of the water treatment plant, as if that was going to be done as a design build which is much more complicated than this project because this yeah. is a commodity item where that's a specialty right. item. But either one can be done design build. But you just want to be have the confidence that you've really covered all the specifications beyond just the dimensions of the building, the number of doors and things. There's other kinds of performance specifications. The, the you know, Right, just the manufacturers. I mean, what, what the products. I mean, the products themselves, mm -hmm. the building components could be yeah, I mean, dramatically different in yeah, cost. You have a, a, a particular... Well, or or the longevity of the if it, I don't know what type of roof this is, but let's just say asphalt shingles have different lives. So if you wanted to specify a performance specification of a minimum of a forty-year shingle, would be an example uh, of a performance steel specification. Right. So, so it's it's one of the things to be careful to make sure that you really know that you've covered the full range of performance specifications. Because the thing that I've seen or heard of happening is that people put a out of bid and you get back and you're really clear when you start getting the back that the lowest bid is not the quality right. and so are you going to be required Reasonably to take low. the lowest design bid or because or, or, a design build 
bid package can also allow you to select something other than the cheapest one if there's a quality difference. You can make a judgment there if you've designed your bid package properly. If you haven't, then you have to go with the lowest one. Well, I mean, so what I would suspect we would be going with would be a, maybe a request for qualifications or um, not just a bid. It sounds like we won't just go for a strict bid. It will be. So it's getting somebody that, that understands the design build process to sit on your side of the table, not just in putting out the specifications, but also monitoring the construction, making sure that what gets built is what they say they're going to build. So it's somebody that is a much lower cost professional than an architect designing a building with all the, with every single component to it, but it is a consultant that. And I'm not that consultant, <laughs> believe me, for, well. for a building like this. Um, that, that leads you through it, make sure you don't get caught up in things you don't know about, and that can um, assist through the whole process. Okay, thanks, John. Um, you know, I guess my feeling would be that I'm supportive of this. I think that there are still all, I think that there are, we're, we're a few steps away from, you know, being able to do that. So, um, you know, I guess the next step, and I, you know, we're, we're just at this point, maybe this could be one of the things that Ken's really helping to prepare mm -hmm. Patty with. So this could be something that, that you know, she, this will be her project to, to um, decide on and move forward with. But, um, you know, so maybe in the first, maybe the second or maybe sometime in August, second meeting in July or August, if you could come back with something more firm. Um, for us to consider in terms of the process. Well, I have one qu question. You were you talking about the possibility of having the the crew room the station quarters, yeah. in different that there were options. Mm -hmm. So, do you, does a decision need to be made about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not at this time, uh, because the one that that we're currently housed in is is serving its purpose. But it will be a, a, a topic of conversation in the future. But I mean, is there a possibility? Of, <laughs> is one of the possibilities having it in this building? Yes, ma'am. So, are you suggesting that the building get built, but not put it in now, or build it and put it in? No, you need to decide up front. So that decision needs to be made before yeah. the the building decision, or at I least that's part of what I heard. I mean, I heard that it was a possibility, and it didn't have to be decided yeah. now. Right. Well, it, it doesn't have to be decided now, but however, what these specifications that he's given does, doesn't include like floor drains and everything else that, that I would like to see go into this building. Mm -hmm. Now, when everything goes in, if there is a possibility, I would, I would like to say, hey, we need to have enough room or a pipe coming out for where we can run a new leach field to where we can run new water just in case we yeah. choose to go at this at a later date. Yeah, I mean you don't you don't you don't need garage doors on a crew room. Right. Yeah, so I would think it would make sense to decide up front what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. And and I would I'm I'm a big disciple of Tom Lehrer if you're familiar with him. He said plagiarize, plagiarize, let no one's work evade your eyes. Don't shade your eyes. God made your eyes. Plagiarize, plagiarize. So there are <laughs> lots reading is another poem. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of song. lots yeah. of specs out there. It's a song. <laughs> well, I mean that just really sets us back, though. I mean that that that's that kind of halts this process because that's a whole nother discussion. That's probably another hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, I, I thought part of the purpose of this building was to have the place where people could shower and stuff. So, I, I, I mean, well, that decision needs to be made well, anyway. No, in terms but when, when we initially looked at it and when we were talking. There was an option for it, but I think the, the important thing is getting our expensive equipment under cover. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I would be I, happy I'm to. I'm like Karen, if we, we want to talk about that, that's a whole different issue. And, and we, do have, we do have two other uh, uh, options to come up with a cruise station. 
and so forth. And as Jason was saying, it's not that's not critical at this point. So. I mean, and I'm not particularly thrilled with the idea of, of them being mm -hmm. in a facility mm -hmm. with diesel, with, with the gas fumes and with, I, I don't think it's an appropriate use of the space, personally. Well, I mean, when you grow up on a farm, the, uh, <laughs> often you'll have a shop like a, with an office in the corner, it's totally insulated, you can have a shower. It's really not that uncommon to have tractors and heavy equipment on one side of the wall and and it's just like a living room on the other side it can be very nice so so I I think it's possible and I think it's possible to retrofit something the to garage door issue is probably the thing that seems one of the more complicated things to work out because if that's going to be a a crew space it doesn't make sense to put garage doors there and then have to take them out that's mm -hmm. that's the slight logistical thing is that what you would do would be take a bay essentially is that the size of the crew space yeah, yeah. actually we would be taking two two doors two bay doors four front. then total or just yeah four front, two front two back okay and and then add a, add a wall there and, and anybody who thinks there's any hope of continuing to use the present crew quarters, I would like to take you and show them. <laughs> Inadequate doesn't do them justice. So we can, uh, are you, are you them, but it's been a suggesting while. that as part of this deal, we include yes. a, a, somewhere or other for the crew to be, whether it's in this building or, well, I don't know. The, yeah. the other I mean, you could, you could keep them where they are, but they are primitive is just doesn't describe it yeah that just it's I mean it's just a much more complicated project during you know the plumbing the mechanical it's just it it just creates a much more complicated project um, but I mean at a minimum we can just figure out now which way we're gonna do it right because I mean my guess is those four extra garage doors have a cost to them so if we don't need them then it's from right so even if we don't do the crew room in phase one, I, I still like the idea of, of trying to figure out how we're going to do it beforehand. So, so what if we just take the four bays out or the two bays out? Do so, do the size of a building without those two bays, and then if you do a crew quarters, put a smaller. You know, you don't need all that height for for the for the crew quarters. So put a smaller building on the front of it, a small metal building. You, you see those all the time where you've got. A warehouse space and then you've got um, an office space in the front if it's cheaper you know the, I mean the, it may or may it may, might not be cheaper to do it that way. the reason why it's taking up so much space is because if you're if you're going to add showers which we desperately need especially working in sanitary conditions yeah yeah no uh, you need showers you need the locker room you need the crew room I mean, it takes up a lot well, more. Well, and space I know, and we need we need male and female. I understand yeah, that. I co-ed workforce. Yes, I understand yes. that. It takes um, a lot more space than what you you may think. But it could be, as Karen was saying, it could be added to the front. It and could be the rest. Of the it could be. Too. It could so be. This is options. Yep. I mean, I, this is just so, I mean, I, it's frustrating to come here thinking we were deciding on one thing and then to find out we're actually talking about something else. Mm -hmm. I really did think all that we were talking about was a garage. I didn't I realize didn't we were that. talking, and this, there's nothing in here about a crew quarters, and that was, that was actually taken out of the project the last time Jason talked about it. Oh. Wasn't it, Jerry? I mean, And it was because we, we would have to discuss water and sewer right going it's, through from mm -hmm. we had Jason you know there's more here. involved here we don't have a water line we would have to ha bring in a new water line we would have to dig a new septic system I mean this it's well is this a, I think what I hear Jason saying is is that getting this equipment covered is so critical that we have to get this building up and we, we need to get it up kind of fast so it sounds like it would be smarter to plan for next year's budget to get the the crew quarters on that budget and probably do it in the Quonset hut. That's why I'm saying you have three right. different options. I mean, it doesn't have to go in this building. Right. Would it be nice? Of course. Well, we need but to do something. But it doesn't have to go. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. It does not have to go in this. And, but it sounds like if we want to get this building up fast, it would be easier to just build this building as strictly bay building, and not have to even think about 
the these other possibilities um, and really just plan on the crew station doing the crew 15. station in 15 in the Quonset probably uh -huh. so, so if but but if so if you really were gonna give up two bays can we can we just make the building smaller I mean it, it seems to me I mean it's, it's probably fifty thousand dollars two doors and and that square footage of building that square footage of slab I mean you might be talking about fifty thousand dollars that could go into a crew into renovating the crew quarters so I mean I would like to really for you to really think about that let's make if if, yeah, if you two. decide that the crew quarters aren't going to go in this new building then let's make the building the size mm -hmm. that we need for the equipment so and does this contemplate 12 bays is that why there are 24 yes overhead doors yeah this so we're talking about maybe taking it down to 10 bays yeah if that would work so this drawing is so this drawing accurate. yes yes that's just a reference of what okay. the building may look like well, whether or not we build, the, it sounds like we're, the crew th rooms, rooms are not going to get built yet, but I think the decision should be made now where they're going to be. Because if it makes most sense to put them in here, <coughs> the building could be built and whatever uh, water lines or whatever could be initially put in. But if this is the best place to put the crew thing. To me, but it that just seems to increases the cost. Jerry, what do you think? You've been looking at this more than any of us. Well, that's part of the decision on whether it goes there, well, the cost. If it, if it were me, I would, this would be strictly housing our vehicles and look for 15, look at doing a good crew station and so forth. And uh, that's the way I would. So you wouldn't build this with the mind of putting it in there? No. no. Okay. You would just build it for the, the bays for, and for, for the, equipment? For the trucks and the equipment and so forth. Because, you know, uh, I think we, if you spend the time and, and kind of look at the quads and how, what we have there, we might be able to come up with an innovative idea to get in the cruise station and uh, utilize some of that space. You know, mm -hmm. you know that's what I would do. Because I think we need people to get in there to really look at the, at the sewer system to draw out where a new leach field and so forth would be. Uh, you know, uh, I think I think if we try to do it now, we're probably delaying ourselves another six months, almost maybe mm -hmm. almost a year. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. I, th I think we have to just go with this planning for it to be equipment and I want to know for sure then if this is the size that the it size needs to be right. if it can be a little bit smaller and we can save that money yeah. especially what the difference in the cost, cost. would be right. what uh, do you think Ken that's fine yeah uh, take a hard look at your storage needs do what you need to cover your current equipment complement and if that's and hope that that saves money that you can divert to creating a better crew quarter and it doesn't have to be in this building it could be in the quonset with then, wiggle room i mean you don't want to you don't want to make it so close to the edge that we're stuck in the same situation with with equipment outside because we didn't build a big enough building but these bays are pretty easy to add on, aren't they? I mean, not that I'm saying we want to add on another bay even in five years. I would like this to be, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 year plan yeah. for this building. Yeah, if you, I mean, if, if, if we were to build this building and, and, and say, you know, 10 to 15 years, we've outgrown it and want to add on more, we've got plenty of more storage to add two more bays onto the end of this building and keep going. Right, right. So but still it's cheaper to get it done in oh, yeah, one absolutely yeah. I mean it's gonna be yeah. more expensive uh -huh. in the future so so I mean obviously you're hearing you're hearing support um, I guess maybe you and Kent and Patty get together and figure out the next steps of, of how to get that to happen and to come back to council and right I'm and sure Jerry, there's gonna have to I be a Jerry second step. Yeah, Jerry yeah. too. Yeah. I'm sure there's gonna have yeah, to be a second step before legislation, yeah. but figure out and you know, do it as quickly as Yeah, because we're definitely we all wanna do this. We wanna do it right and we wanna do it obviously as economically as possible so that we can then also do the, the crew room which we do get that you need. 
Thank Thanks, you. Jason. Thanks, Jason. Um, next on the agenda is water plant report uh, timeline. Um, Marianne and I met with Kent and Joe Bates um, to talk about um, a timeline on the project. Kent, do you have um, maybe a summary of that meeting? We would like to, Joe and I, I think, have a pretty good idea of where we'd like to see things end up. The issue is going to be developing public support for them. Uh, two things that we're, we're suggesting are do not rehab the current plant, go with a new plant, and include softening. And if you can't include softening because it's politically unsupportable at the moment, then at least make provisions for doing it in the future because we think it's a very important consideration. Um, the current plant probably can't take softening. It would be very, very difficult to, uh, to uh, interpose it within, in, into the plant the way it's structured now. So uh, we would like to bring in an expert that helped us with the wastewater plant. Companies called Hazen and Sawyer and they do strictly water and wastewater treatment plants and ask them to talk about two topics. One is softening, and one of, their, one of their suggestions is that we probably would not be allowed by Ohio EPA to do an ion softening plant, that they, uh, they've been very reluctant to issue permits for that style of plant because of the salt content of the discharge and the effect it has on the receiving stream. So that would almost force us to go to some other form of softening if we do that, like a lime softening thing, similar to what Springfield does. That's more expensive, so that's one of the things we need to wrestle with. And then the other question we want to address is, uh, do we do a conventional uh, design up front and then bid, or do we do a design build, sort of a telescope design build process? And uh, the person we'd invite to talk to us is given presentations on both of those topics at national conferences and I think is acknowledged as a, an expert in the field. And so we'd like to bring them, is it January 22nd uh, or July 22nd, excuse me? Right. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I will tell you something that, that Kent didn't say, that, but that he was really kind of the first thing he said in this, when, when Marianne and I were there, that he absolutely feels that this, um, project can't wait that we need to move forward as quickly as possible and the one thing and this isn't discounting having these folks come and talk about the the, the two options but it, it essentially eliminates the ability to do a conventional um, a conventional project where we do a design that then goes out for bids because that probably doubles the the time frame design build you can essentially have design building happening while there's still finished design going on so it almost forces us into a design build which i don't doesn't bother me i mean that's i think that's probably for this project the best the best approach anyway um so but what what we were talking about from a time frame was um maybe at the july i think it was the second meeting in july yes. to talk about softening um August meeting, one of the August meetings to talk new or rehab, um, and then in September, then to bring in the finance person. And we may want to do those just consecutively. I mean, maybe we can't, we can't, we don't need to leave that much time between. I would hope not. Each of the discussions. I would like to have this done. So, yeah. Right. Decided. Because honestly, I mean, just based on what he's saying, I, I think we. I, I personally am leaning towards the new plant, and so I would really like to focus our energies on that. Right, good, okay. Uh, and um, I, I concur. I mean, I'm both uh, Kent and uh, Joe, uh, that's what they favor, and uh, unless there's some other very compelling argument, I would go with what staff favors. The issue of the softening, especially the additional cost which we don't even know yet about doing lime uh, is is an issue, but no. Uh, can can we to because I like to see us move forward. Can yeah. can we as a council say we, we want to move forward with the uh, 
building a new plant? I mean, I would go um, for it. Um, you know, whatever we need to do to do that. And then softening will be the, the, the other key issue. And is the design build, design. I'd go well, for I mean, too. we could put out an RFQ for design build contractors. We could make a decision to put out an RFQ for design build contractors right now, couldn't we? Yes. We'd and well, we'd need to have a resolution. Or right, a but but I mean, we could tell Kent to do that, to have that ready for the next meeting, and then in that process, in that time frame after that, then we could be talking about the softening. We could, you know, that design build contractor, we can tell them anything, you know, that they that we want to put into it. Would we still get the presentation that? I yeah, think we could, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that yeah. actually, I hadn't thought about that. That really puts us way ahead if we do that. That, that sounds so much better. I think we we really need to. We need. We've talked about this Just really long, for a long, long time. time. Okay. And there's. I want, I'd like to hear from Brian. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, um, I've, I've been persuaded from the discussions that I've had and what I've heard that we can agree on a new plan. So, and yeah, I, I love the idea of making it happen. So I agree with that. So if we can start getting the, the request for proposals out, that's great. And Joe also, he's just came back from a water conference. Was it a water conference? He's in Boston right in, now. In Boston. So he's going to come back with some great contacts, with some great information. So I'm really excited about that. And there is a lime softening plant in West Liberty, Ohio, which is not very far. He was going to set up, mm -hmm. um, right, he was going to set up a tour um, of that like we did of Springfield and our own plant. So when he gets back, he will be working on, on um, pulling that together. So you fight. So so that's going to be one of the things that can't. It's going to be also working with the patty mm -hmm. that we decided on. Do we need to vote on that? I don't. I mean, I think we'll have a resolution on our yeah. next okay. meeting, okay. and that so, will service the vote. So the written resolution for us to move forward with the mm -hmm. building a new plan. Good. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Comments. Since the softening is still an open issue, you might consider going forward with your design build with a provision for softening. Leave the space and the connections and the, mm -hmm. and the facilities for it, and then that we can decide in the future whether to community soften or individually soften. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I would John? Do that. Um, uh, two things. I do have a list from EPA of small lime softening plants in this area. West Liberty is one of them, and it's a much older plant. Um, there's two other newer plants. I don't have the list with me, but you can look at those two. They're newer plants. Um, two things about it. One is that if you're going to design, softening is not interchangeable. If you're going to mm -hmm. design a, a lime softening mm -hmm. plant, that'll also take out your, your um, iron and manganese inherently with the lime softening process. So it's not right. that you design a water treatment plant for iron and manganese and then tack on softening. You can, you can do that if it's ion exchange softening. You cannot do that if it's lime softening. Right. So the decision for lime softening has to be made at the beginning of the process if you're going to go that way at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, an, it's, yeah. it's not a it. decision mm -hmm. that right. comes later. Okay, um, that makes sense. So you, and the other thing with, the, with lime softening, there's two forms of lime. There's quick lime, which is calcium oxide, and there's um, hydrated lime, calcium hydroxide. For a lot of small plants, they'll go with calcium hydroxide, but then that would eliminate the ability to interface with the city of Dayton's re uh, re um, recalcification plant. In other words, when you can take a lime sludge to the city of Dayton, they'll re recalcine it, and you can get your fresh lime but you can only get quick lime from them you can't get hydrated lime no. so that's another factor in the design of the no. plant mm -hmm. so it's some decision you've got, you've got to look at some of these issues up front yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then make and then decide which way to go thanks john and the thing that john just mentioned actually is really exciting to me yeah. because dayton is actually kind of 
we they may be willing to take the lime sludge and then they actually <coughs> re yeah. they fire it and, they re, and, and and so the idea I mean talk about sustainability yeah I mean that's the kind so of collaboration exciting. that yeah. I think is and that's what better than some of the other getting water from Springfield are doing and, and the city of Dayton has actually got a there's there's a proposal out now I don't know which firm is going to do the work to expand the capacity not of the kiln the kiln has enough capacity it's the capacity to receive the um, waste lime sludge from other water treatment plants into their facility um, as the raw material for recalcining it. And the recalcined lime is actually higher quality than the new lime prepared from limestone rock. Mm -hmm. So there's some really nice synergies there, yeah. but that's a, a critical design decision at the beginning of the design process for a lime softening plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Great. John. Thanks. So are you clear on what mm -hmm. to do for the next meeting? We're, that I mean, potentially have, you know, be ready for, with an RFQ, bring an RFQ for us to, to approve re with a resolution. Okay. okay. But, but you, you can, can we do that before we have the line, the softening? Yeah. Part? I think, yeah. Well, I mean, can't we ask for? Uh, for alternatives? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, an RFQ, it would be a, a somebody to, to design and build a water plant. They don't care. Oh, okay. We would be picking the oh, okay. contractor yeah. that we felt would be, we were most comfortable. The actual design build process isn't quite that way. There's a there's whole aspect of state law for public entities with design build process. So you need enough definition of the project. So you're not just, you got to define the project well enough that you can have apples to apples comparison in your RFQ. You might actually be best if you have that design build expert have the discussion about it. And this is one where I'd strongly recommend you have the consultant who's going to write the specs and that you use that consultant not to design the whole plan but to work out some of these questions with you and get a clear decision on which way you're going to go and then have the specs for the RFQ for the design build contractor or the design build team based on what that person would do so the, in that scenario the RFQ could be done next week for the consultant that would be guiding the process or helping assist the process and move the process quickly and more efficiently but I think you're way too early to actually put out an RFQ for a design build contractor to mm -hmm. know what fundamentally what you want built. So an RFQ for the consultant is what you're but saying. But an RFQ just. for the the consultant and Ken if you've got the name of this expert you could probably just have a conversation with him on how to design that RFQ. Sure. Because um, then you can have that consultant on board because you're going to want somebody sitting on your side of the table working with the design build contractor. This is not a commodity item. Right and, and unfortunately our staff is just I mean we just don't have enough staff. We don't have the staff capacity to be able to, to manage a three million dollar yeah. construction project. Yeah. And that's yeah. essentially what we're yeah. designing construction. Pro that's a good mm -hmm. point. Okay. okay. Thanks, John. Okay. So is it clear what we're at, what we need? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. And then maybe we, and then, but then also, so then at that meeting, if, if possible, I mean, if we could have yeah. Hazen and Sawyer, somebody from there come to the next meeting. July 7th. Um, I, what do you th all think? Sure. Yeah. If, they yeah, if, they're, if they're available. Okay. Okay. And then if not that, then what, then whatever the, the, the is it the 21st, I think. I'm not sure what the date yes. is. Yeah, we, we have three weeks to the next council meeting, yeah. so yeah. it gives a little more lead time. Yeah. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, um, I um, have a press release here that we will send to you, Diane, but I will would like to read it um, this evening. Um, Village Council was disappointed in the recent decision of the Court of Appeals that affirmed the, le the legality of the terms of an easement across the property of former village manager Howard Cahoe, located at the intersection of East Hyde Road and Spillan Road. The decision means that the current owners of the Cahoe property may have multiple tap-ins to the village sanitary sewer and water lines as the property develops in direct conflict with the village policy to not extend utilities, utilities outside the corporate limits. In arriving at its 2009 decision to challenge the Cahoe easement when a lawsuit was filed by the current property owners, 
Council could find no evidence from its records that Cahill had ever presented the terms of this easement to Council or that Council had ever accepted the easement terms. The timing of the easement was suspect also in that even though the sewer line was completed across the Cahill property in 1963, Cahill did not cause the written deed of easement to be prepared, signed, or recorded until 11 years later, the very day after he attended his last meeting as village manager. In the view of Village Council, the action of Mr. Cahoe suggests a breach of protocol and possible self-dealing by a public official. Village Council was also conscious that residential development outside the village borders would put an added burden on village services. Despite its disappointment in the court's decision, Council has decided not to expend further resources in this matter. And I also want to make it clear, and I um, see that Mr. Strewing is here, that, that council has never had um, any ill feelings. This has never been about um, Mr. Strewing and, Mr. St and, and his ownership of the property. This has always been about um, how we, ha the predecessor, the, the preceding property owner. Um, and, and so um, we, we just want Mr. Strewing to understand that. And that's really that's all that we'll be saying about that matter at this point. Um, let's see, Ken or Kent, excuse me. Um, do you have a manager's report? I'm just going to mention a couple of things for the press. Um, we rely on Dayton Power and Light to bring electrical power to us over their lines. We have a transmission agreement. Uh, it expires at the end of this year. Uh, we had expected a fairly routine extension or renewal, and instead they've advised us they're going to quadruple their rates. Uh, Dayton Power and Light is inclined to play the bully and play games. Uh, this isn't the first time they've tried to do things like this with their municipal customers. And uh, it's, not, it's not in their hands to make the decision. Ultimately, if we can't come to an agreement with them, we go to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they will make a decision. And uh, we're uh, certain that there's no feasible, no real chance that they can justify quadrupling the rates. So uh, anyway, we're, we're working on that currently. We're doing it through American Municipal Power, and this is a case where uh, we have some bigger cities who are our allies and partners in this, city of Piqua, for example, and uh, they've got a full-time electric staff that's very competent and very knowledgeable, and we rely a lot on their advice and their help in this. So uh, there are 13 municipalities that are uh, municipal electric uh, customers within the DPNL area. That's, so is that the Western with, Area Service yes, Group? So yes. is that who we're working through? Is, yes. Okay, good. Um, some things I'd like to bring up at the next meeting or have Patty bring up. Um, our contract with Rumpke is expiring this year. The current contract provides that we can extend it a year at a time on two occasions, and Rumpke has offered to extend the contract for a year at the same price that we're currently paying. And as long as you concur, I would like to bring that uh, to you as a resolution mm -hmm. okay. at the next meeting. That sounds good. Uh, Absolutely. Um, uh, the police department concurs with the petitioner that uh, stop signs at Herman Street and High Street would be advisable. So I will bring that to you as a... Re as a that is so hard for me to believe. Is that, <laughs> that is bizarre. <laughs> Why is that? Because I go through that intersection almost every day. I just, I don't understand it. I mean, you're going to have to square it off. I, I, I really have a hard time with that. Yeah, I don't get how it's going to work. It's at that corner? It's yeah. not even a corner. Yeah, it's I mean, curve. it's the curve. Yeah. I, I just don't get it. Okay. Be a last stop signs. Well, don't, or don't, don't vote, yeah, vote it down. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so if you, so, so, yeah. I mean, I guess I, w I would have to see what their plan is for yeah. squaring yeah. off the, pro the street and. Okay. It's, and I'm it's, assuming they'd get with Jason too, because you're streets, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. See just how that, that intersection would now work. Well, so it sounds like it would be good if 
if we could get a visual or some, you know, clear description of what's going to happen, what would happen? Um, we've been talking about uh, reconciling residents and beavers, and so uh, we've, uh, we're tentatively talking about a, I call it the beaver summit on June 25th. <laughs> Is that still feasible, do you think? Uh, we will notify the beavers of this. Okay, well, Are they going to be in attendance? They, they need to be at the table, don't they? Their representatives <laughs> will be in attendance. They have at the table without having them gnawing on the list. I know, I was going to oh. say. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I, on the other hand, I've heard they don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I've had a couple of instances lately where I've had to uh, tell private nonprofits who want help from the village that we're becoming less and less able to extend that help. And it, I was invited. I was invited probably by accident to a meeting of the. There's a nonprofit coalition. Mm -hmm. It's meeting tomorrow, mm -hmm. and initially I said, no, I'm a short timer, I'm not going to come. And then I thought, maybe this is a perfect opportunity and I'd be the perfect person to carry the bad news that we're no longer in a position to do some of the things we've been doing in the past. So uh, I'm going to go and try to explain some of our financial realities. Um, I came here in 1979. It was just after... Richard Nixon had announced revenue sharing. So the village had this new pot of money, this windfall that it hadn't expected and really didn't have a use for. And we invited <laughs> at that time in applications from local nonprofits for support from this new found source of money. And the village distributed a fair share of it. Mm -hmm. I remember it particularly because I'd had a lifelong interest in learning to play the recorder and the early music group was one of the groups that yeah. they had decided would get some money. Huh. So, um, yeah, I thought it was interesting and exciting. Now we're sort of in the reverse situation. The governor's been taking money back from the cities, and maybe we should tell them to go to the casing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so well, and I think, Ken, maybe the other great thing to emphasize is that I, I do think the village is supporting collaborations wherever we can. Oh, you know, just, and so I think that sure. you know, while the money might not be there, we have facilities, we have other things. So, very good. Okay. That's well, all I, have. I have a quick question for you. Yes, I, I understand that uh, me, so. soon we'll, we'll be able report. to see more lighting out in the uh, parking lot. I, wanted to say, but we can't I hadn't heard that. We can. Uh, do you know anything about that, Jason? Yes, Johnny and I have talked about it. We have not presented it to okay. any as of yet. Okay. Yeah, but that, I think we need because it's it's. Yeah, there are lights really, out there. Some people don't think they're adequate. Yeah, it's very so. it's very. We'll, we'll see it tonight. It's okay. it's, uh, it's dark. It's dark, dark. Okay. So, you know, yeah, jo Johnny just finalized those quote numbers. Okay, good. Okay. So, so, so we should hear, be hearing that. Soon. Yes, we'll we'll sit down with Mr. Russell. Gotcha. Okay. okay good. It's one thing I'd like to point out that's different about now from 20 years ago is uh, I think our staff is very competent and very capable and they show a lot of initiative and I'm always happy to see them come up with ideas and not wait to be prodded to do something that they come up with ideas on their own ways to make improvements. So thank you Jason. What about the electric fund and the rate increase? Well, I made a mention. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, we set utility rates, and they tend to be static for several years, five years, 10 years at a time. We last set electric rates 12 years ago. And what happens is we set a rate up at this level, and our expenses are down here, and the rate continues along on a plane, and the expenses slowly come up to meet the revenue. And then for a few years, we operate at a loss until the reserves get drawn down to a certain point, and then we reset the rates. So it's, it's a ratchet, effectively. It's not a smooth progression. And so my suggestion has been that, yes, over the last several years, uh, electric expenses have exceeded electric income, and it hasn't been by a great deal. And the, rev the, the balance in the electric fund at the beginning of this year 
was over 2.7 million, so it's still very healthy, but it has been decreasing. So um, you would have to decide when is the time. Do we start looking for more money when the balance is down to 2 million or 1 million? Or, you know, at what point do we start looking at that? But yeah, we're, we're, we are at a point now where expenses exceed revenues and we're eating into our balance. The balance is still healthy. It's not an emergency, but it's time to start thinking about what to do about electric rates. Thanks. And I would say this thing with the DPNL transmission rates would have be a factor. So we would probably want that to work out before we did anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, do you want? Are you? Yeah. Are you? Are you? Are you done? I'm done. Okay. I, I don't have any yeah, just to let folks know, there is a special meeting scheduled for Planning Commission June 23rd at 7 p.m. And that is a continuation of the hearing open on June 9th regarding Antioch College's conditionally use request. I want to congratulate Karen for surviving the street here and apparent with no apparent ill effects. And uh, thank Kent for being a calm, steady, good humored, and knowledgeable presence, um, which I think really helped with the, the search for the next village manager. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, standing reports. Um, Jerry, if you could maybe, um, because Lori did miss her last two meetings, I can report on Green County. Can you report on planning? Yeah, real quick. It, as uh, Judy said, we're uh, going to have a special meeting on the 23rd of June to continue the discussion on the uh, uh, solar array. Could you report on the two conditional oh, uses we, that were approved? We, we approved the conditional use for the food truck out at Antioch Midwest, and we approved the, uh, uh, taste, the tasting room for the Petruvian. Petruvian. Yeah, great. Mm. With, uh, I think, and the caveat there was that they had to have at least one hand, paved handicap parking space and keep the hours the same and as the, the brewery hours would be the same as the brewery. Right. Um, Green County Regional Planning there usually isn't much to report there but um, there actually is something potentially of significance and that is that um, the county is has dramatically reduced the funding for regional planning to the point where um, they're going to run out of money in September um, it's, I'm sure that they will at least fund it through the end of 2014. The county will pony up to fund it through the end of 2014, but um, we don't know beyond that. And um, Green County Regional Planning and Stephen um, Anderson have been pretty good to us. I mean, Stephen was very involved in both the visioning and the zoning rewrite. So, and obviously we're still, we're currently using their services as our zoning staff. So it's of concern to me, it's of concern to the townships. So um, a contingent of us are going to be going to, to Green County Planning Commission, or excuse me, Green County Commission meetings to, to express our support. I mean, there will definitely be in one way to increase it, or one way to help get some funding is to increase the developer fees. Um, which they can do, um, but they also might increase the fees to the membership, which is of which we are one, and I think we're already paying maybe five or six hundred. So you know, I don't know that you know how much more we would want to expend to be members of that organization. Um, but we will we will see. But I just wanted to let you know that that it is at risk. I may be asking council to provide a letter of support um, to the commissioners in the future. I'll just go ahead and do my others um, while I'm talking. Um, Judy mentioned Street Fair. I, it was, it was um, everything went very well. Um, we've got a guy here who worked very hard and um, as did all of his other crews. And so I just wanna thank everybody, the community. Um, I think things kind of keep getting smoother and um, we're working out the kinks and you know, it was it was it was very successful. So I appreciate everybody's understanding and um, collaboration. And MVRPC, you saw this map yeah. in the in the packet. So a few years ago, I guess a few years ago, we got very involved when when we were working on the comp plan. 
we got very involved in, with MVRPC at, at defining our facility planning area, which is basically the area um, that if sewer is extended within that area, it will either be by us or we will at least have a say. We'll be at the table if somebody decides to develop in an area that is within our facility our planning urban service area. Boundary. No, is that facility planning area different is different. Facility planning area is about sewer service. It's about extension of sewer service. So um, if you if you look at these colors and if you look at that line and if you look at the numbers of percent increase, it's pretty significant. And so at the last MBR, it that white line? The white line, line, that white line defines our facility planning area. Um, the yellow dot in the middle is Yellow Springs, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can just kind of geographically see what's happening. I mean, the one that was, that's so shocking to me is, is it looks like that 68 that they're, you know, they're putting the section north on 68 in Greene County at 25 percent. Now what I was told, okay, I've got to find my little note from MVR, from, from the guy at MVRPC. This is what he said, that they're, it's not an exact science. These are 25 year projections and they're looking at current trends and projecting the future. Um, and it, it, this is more about traffic analysis and we are certainly not obligated I mean we, and it's clear that we're not obligated to provide sewer for any of this but um, Chris was at the meeting Chris Mutcher was at the meeting representing Miami Township I was there obviously representing Yellow Springs I asked a lot of questions I didn't want to dominate something that was you know kind of just so specific to Yellow Springs but I ended up, I did ask the same questions. I'm not really that worried about it. I think it's something that I want to be aware of. Um, I think that these these population projections are probably much higher than, than they yeah, than I is wish realistic. that Springfield was on there just to see. Well, what that's, they were they're not part about. of NBRPC. Right, but just to um, see what they were thinking about them in comparison. But, but anyway, um, I, I abstained. And Chris voted no. So <laughs> it's really sprawl. It, yeah, absolutely. I mean, all absolutely. of the municipalities are either no growth or decrease, and it's the outlying areas. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 clearly, I mean, you know, it's it's, Beaver it's Creek, going it's going west, and and you know, we're not we're not necessarily going to have control over this because you know, Greene County or Fairborn could decide to extend sewer service into Bath Township, which, which a big part of this on the eastern or on the western side of our F facility planning area is Bath Township. We don't really have control. We'll at least be at the table though. Same thing south of Xenia Township, but we're not going to have control if I, Xenia Township wouldn't extend it, but, but Greene County could or the city of Xenia could. So, um, and John uh, knows, you know, a lot more about this. He actually was involved in the TAC meeting where this was first discussed. You know, first of all, all these population projections start at the state level, and, and somebody oh. doing demographics decides that Ohio is going to grow by X number of people. And then somebody at the state level says, well, we think that so much, such and such a percentage is going to go to the Cleveland area, or maybe Cleveland's going to continue to lose population. And they, somebody using models divides it up among different regions, and it gets to uh, the different regional groups like MVRPC or, or Sanko down in, not in Sanko, but the, there's a, a group down in the, in the South uh, Cincinnati area. OKI. Okay, yeah, OKI, okay, okay, yeah. right, OKI. Okay, and then that organization has been given a number of people that are going to, they've got to decide how it's going to get split <laughs> up. And so they, they shuffle the cards and figure out how they're going to think they're going to do things and look at trends and so forth and assign numbers to these traffic um, area zones. Um, and that's been going on, this process has been going on for years and years and years. The only thing that's different this year was that. Um, there's been issues around how um, that organizations looking at doing sewer surface or sewers extensions or treatment plants have had to look at population projections and the only thing anybody has to go on are the traffic analysis zones which don't correspond with the facilities planning areas. So this year they decided to try to 
adapt it to facilities planning areas. When I look at this, what I see is a, a set of planners' sense of where the pressures are going to be. There's absolutely no requirement that you plan to accommodate that pressure. You can actually use it to say, how are you going to resist the, Mitigate and, it. Resist mm -hmm. the pressure? And mm -hmm. uh, Miami, and this is where Miami Township comes in because you're really looking at a lot of that as being, you know, in the immediate areas being uh, the Miami Township part, is that Miami Township is looking at zoning regulations to um, maintain the agricultural character of the township and to restrict housing to that which is supportive of the agricultural nature of the township without reducing property holders' rights. So there's a lot that's consistent with the values of Yellow Springs and what the township zoning people are doing, which would help to resist this. The other thing is that the, the numbers that gets first go to the county and then get divided up among different places, townships and things within the county are different uh, traffic area zones within the county. Um, if, if Beaver Creek had a great big huge uh, another development project with a lot of housing, then essentially they're sucking some of that additional population growth that was spread out more evenly and concentrating it in Beaver Creek and then there's less pressure elsewhere. So it's a very, I don't get too worried about it. I think of it more as, okay, the planners think that Greene County is a, a major growth area. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do as the township and as the village to create the kind of environment we want? Um, one, th just uh, let's think about facilities planning area distinct from urban service area. The urban service area is what Yellow Springs defined as the area that you can extend gravity sewer and to extend public sewers beyond that would require lift stations and it's your policy not to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's the urban service boundary. The facilities planning area where the leverage comes in there and where Karen's right that you get a seat at the table is that Ohio EPA is cannot approve wastewater facilities that are not consistent with the facilities uh, with the facilities plan that Yellow Springs is in charge of and is created by how it mapped that area. So back when all this was being done, map the urban service boundary is the area that would expect to have public sewers and map the rest of the area as to be expected not be on public sewers, <laughs> which means it's on on-site systems. And therefore, it's very hard to put in, well, the only kinds of developments that can go in are large lots that can have, each one have their own septic tanks to be consistent with the facilities plan. But then that becomes inconsistent with the township zoning requirements. So these things interact with each other. It was a fairly long explanation, but hopefully that helped understand why I'm not too concerned about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not concerned. It's just, it's just something significant. When something's significant, I don't report on everything from MVRPC, but when there's something significant that specifically directs, you know, is related to Yellow Springs, I do. And, I mean, what I, I, I you know, what John said about Beaver Creek, I'd like to see that yellow dot of Yellow Springs be red. I mean, w that's where the growth, yeah. the residential growth needs to be, right. is if in you Yellow do the Springs. Housing things and do things that really encourage growth in Yellow Springs, you're actually reducing the pressure then on the township. Mm -hmm. Right. So th these things all kind of go together. The, um, I just lost the track, but the, oh, I know what it was. Um, as a result of this particular issue, uh, since I'm the township representative to the technical advisory committee, which sees all this stuff before the executive committee does, um, Karen and I have worked out a process by which I'll inform her of the things that are coming up from the Technical Advisory Committee so she'll have uh, more advanced knowledge of what's going on, of the cooperation between, between us. Thanks, John. Um, Thanks. Jerry? Uh, me mediation, they're going to be uh, scheduling a meeting next month. They have s some new, new uh, energy in the mediation that went through the training and so forth. So, so John's going to convene the group. They don't meet that often. And of course, we've heard a lot of discussion on CR, and uh, they will probably have a pamphlet for us at the next meeting. 
Brian, do you want to handle uh, library? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention a few things that came up at the meeting that I sat in for Jerry. So first of all, um, did we, the main issue was about the schedule for fixing the roof. So Jason and I are working on that. Okay, good. All right. So, and, and they were just. I can't give you a time yet. But. Right. I just know that was kind of a priority to the commission to get a report back on that. And then the other thing that was brought up was um, we took a little tour of the facilities and they wanted to point out the exposed HVAC system in the back and they wanted the village to just be aware that that was not secure and that maybe a plan for securing that should be considered. That's actually what got approved in our budget is the um, uh, watchdog system which okay. will contain all that um, MS, MSD hasn't had uh, the opportunity to place it on the building yet but they are in the process of looking how to, to best utilize that space and do that okay is, is this is this are they concerned about people stealing metal or? yes uh, okay yeah and so there were different ideas about should there be a wall or whatever but you know that those were the two right Okay. In terms of chain link fence, and, uh, you know, that there was a, a, was it also the concern of someone turning the power off to you? Yeah, they've got locks on that now, but so, um, it's just the kids pl might play on. Okay. Yep, but it was a good meeting. Uh, you know, basically they just reiterated that as soon as we know if we can communicate with them, that would be great so that they can plan. Um, as far as the Human Relations Commission, so uh, our three new members did come on board at our last meeting, was, which was this past Thursday. Um, I did want to mention, in particular, the Harmony Rain Barrel Project and just what happened with that, because I think it was a really great example of, actually it was something that Lori articulated really well a while back about uh, seed money that could then lead into developing the project. So uh, the Harmony Rain Barrel, they ended up raising $1,500 um, with the raffle sales, which I thought was pretty impressive. Uh, that about doubled the money that we invested um, from the village in, and most of that went to commissioning the artists to doing it. So it's brought a lot of attention to uh, the mental health issues, and that's gonna go towards fund funding uh, mental health first aid. So that will be something that uh, community members can take advantage of. Um, so it's you know kind of connected to things that they've wanted uh, the police department to do with uh, the CIT um, uh, crisis intervention training. But this is something that anybody can do. And so so I thought that was a really neat outcome. Uh, we are also going to be supporting the uh, YS Pride uh, Festival, which um, uh, or celebration that Karen mentioned. And in addition, uh, we are sponsors, I mentioned before, of the 365 Project uh, talk that's happening on Saturday. Uh, for the Community Access Panel, I wanted to mention that we had a great meeting with AVI, um, and they came and looked at the space. So this was related to our rehabbing council chambers. Uh, we have gotten a proposal from them, which Jerry's evaluating. Uh, I, I sat in for him, and fortunately, Paul was here, so he could also talk about the Channel 5 side of things and, and give a lot of the technical details. Uh, so that's moving along. The other thing with community access is Paul has had a meeting with uh, someone from Antioch College, and we're now sort of working on our mission to identify how citizens use Channel 5, and how we can improve uh, what we're doing to target that. So that's that's sort of our new focus. Um, Public Art Commission, there's actually a lot to report, but I'll keep it short. Um, great things happening with the skate park. Uh, there's a group of citizens now, parents, skaters, other interested parties. They did a cleanup on Sunday. They're working on fundraisers. And they actually have in this idea how can they sort of match the funds that the village has uh, put forward or allocated to the skate park. And again, that reminds me of our discussion when we talked about how can we have real community collaborations, um, the village doing what it can, the community you know, sort of filling in the gaps. And uh, so there's a lot of great input that they're gathering to help us come up with the best plan. Um, 
As far as uh, we talked a little bit about Ellis Park, um, I know that uh, Kent and uh, the other village staff have looked at some different solutions. Yeah, um, Ed, Ed Dressler, for example, has suggested that one of the easy ways to provide a bridge there would be to use aluminum structures like they use for docks at marinas. And I think Jason may be looking at that. I've taken a look at some. It looks like it'd be a relatively low cost way to solve the problem. Yeah, one thing that came up um, at our meeting was I think there was a consensus that we're really focusing more on functionality than on aesthetics yes. for Ellis Park. And, and I agree with that recommendation. That seems to be uh, to make sense, and that's also a way to keep down the cost. Um, street musicians, I wanted to let everybody know that we are still working on that. Um, we have continued to uh, get as much feedback from the people that are affected, the stakeholders. Uh, at this point, um, the police department's looking at it and thinking about uh, options under our current code that are possible. One idea was that was mentioned was signage uh, so that there possibly could be places where if it is really impacting the business, that might be an option. I haven't gotten the final word on that yet. I know for street fair, we tried the moving street musicians around. We didn't. I thought we did try that. Uh, no, we I decided was, not to. Okay, okay. I was told that we were going to try that. Um, well, we it was at least talked about. Um, and so that kind of ties into uh, the Public Art Commission has kind of, uh, again, recommended that we do try to pursue the street musician agreement idea. So something that's uh, more of a mutual respect kind of thing. And uh, we've also gotten examples of ordinances if we have to uh, go in that direction. Um, I have gotten some feedback that it would certainly be helpful to clarify policy. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, still in discussion, still being worked on. I think we've come the, to the conclusion that this is not going to be an issue that we can easily resolve. So in the meantime, you know, I think it is important for people to communicate, hopefully in a positive manner. Uh, and the last thing, um, I think maybe we can just save it for our next meeting since Lori left, but on the table, uh, Christine Monroe Beard has sent an application to be on the Public Art Commission. We do have two spots for that, and so I do want to nominate her, um, but I think... When's your next meeting? It's on the 16th, actually, so we have time uh, of July, so we can do that at our July 7th meeting, um, but I certainly would recommend her, uh, especially representing our uh, business owner interests. <laughs> okay, energy board. Um, I actually, uh, the energy board met while I was on vacation and I forgot to get a replacement. I did not go to that meeting. So I can't report on that meeting, but I did go to the previous meeting, the May meeting, and during that meeting, the discussion centered on two things, on the Antioch Solar Farm, and out of the discussion came the decision to write a letter of recommendation to the Planning Commission to approve the solar array, and that letter was also sent to council, I think. It was a resolution. A resolution. They actually wrote a resolution. Resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the other thing that was brought up was Senate Bill uh, 310, which then I wrote that letter that council sent. And it's already, he's already Stamped signed it. it. So it's too late now. I mean, it's done. Yeah. So I think he signed it on Sunday. Mm, um, really? Yeah, I think he just signed it a couple days ago. Mm. Sharon, there's one thing I feel to mention that came out of the planning. Um, there were two alternates there at the meeting, and Chris is looking into, since the meeting was, uh, uh, we didn't table it, but we're having an additional meeting. I think it was continued. Continued. He was going to check in to see should the alternates attend or should the primaries attend, since the alternates had started with uh, the hearing, so. 
Okay. Um, okay. Um, future agenda items. Um, and I have to say that this meeting has gotten out of hand, and I don't like to see those hours on the clock, and I apologize for letting it happen. So um, I don't want this to happen, to continue. <laughs> so I'll try to keep do a better job of keeping things on track. Um, I don't know if we actually have any schedules. We don't have any legislation. Do we have any legislation for the yeah. next meeting? You've got Ordinance 2014-16 coming back. Oh, that's what you're right. You got, right. You'll have re resolutions for an RFQ for a consultant to walk you through to the design build okay. process. 2014, oh, sorry. Uh, resolution for uh, Rumkey. Yeah, stop then, sign. Oh, are you bringing a resolution for the stop sign? Well, it'll be an ordinance. It has a penalty attached. I think it has to be an ordinance. Okay. Okay. Um, that's Hazen and Sawyer if they can get here. Right. right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Those, so that's what. And we've got a swearing in of our new manager. Kent will be here. I don't know if you'll oh. be at the table or be. I'll be in the audience. Okay. But. Um, and. I'm, we're checking to see if I'm going to um, swear Patty in or if Dave will swear her in. Um, we're checking to see the legal requirements there. Um, Port Authority, water softening, I mean, that's going to, the water softening, you know, it would, be, it would actually be great if he could combine them in both sure. discussions, it seems unnecessary um, to take two meetings for that. So. Um, financial report, I think Melissa is saying maybe mid, mid July. Yeah, she did say she wanted the 21st. July 21. Yeah. Okay, so we'll put that. The others, I think, are just dependent we upon. Must, um, must have a tax budget coming up soon, don't we? Yeah, I think she's working. Yeah. Yeah, she needs her. So mid mid year numbers mid -year. So I think that's that is enough um, enough of an agenda for um, Patty's first meeting, especially considering she's going to get a pile of stuff like that of um, all the projects that are in progress. We might have a report about the glass farm and the, the beavers. At least something. Will they be in attendance? Beavers. Oh. Oh. <laughs> And uh, we don't they're gonna, need to. They're going to come down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Actually, they could. They could. That's surely how they got to the glass farm is they came all the way sure. from the Glen. It, it doesn't need to be on the, for the next meeting, but I think we should uh, keep on our radar um, having eGov website updates now that that's moving along. So and I have not. Have you been yes. working on it? Yeah, we, okay. uh, we uh, Ruth Ann and I had uh, a meeting. Um, it was very productive. I filled out the. I think I was the only one that did the questionnaire. <laughs> did you do it, Judy? I didn't do it. Ruthann was wending her way through it. Yeah. Um, it but they had they had my questionnaire for our discussion. Um, but I'm thinking uh, maybe the end of July or beginning of August. But we should start tracking that. Okay. <coughs> um, motion to adjourn I, I would just oh, like sorry. to say that uh, I want to acknowledge Kent too I mean um, having you be here has it, it's you add I guess sort of like a homey quality to this it, a very friendly um, environment and I think it really has like I mean uh, Jerry already said it but I just wanted to say say it also because you made such a contribution, and you came in at a very difficult time and made this so e not easy, but an ease with an ease. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, We're going to miss you. Yep. Looking forward to Patty, and I'm sure you're looking forward to, and your <laughs> wife is looking forward to having you home. So I'm not sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nancy, for sharing Kent for so long. <laughs> Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 She likes it when I have other people to supervise other than her. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right.